uh, welcome to the sixth public hearing for the inquiry into road tolling regimes. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Bunurong people, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. I pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Today at this hearing, we will hear from local business owners, councils and residents affected by the tolling arrangements for the M5 motorway. Before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearings. Today's hearing is being broadcast live via the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearings will be placed on the committee's website as soon as it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, media representatives are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the proceedings. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses might say outside of the evidence of the hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make to the media or to others after you complete your evidence. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. In that regard, it's important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry's terms of reference and avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. If witnesses are unable to answer a question today and want more time to respond, they can take a question on notice. Written answers to questions taken on notice are to be provided within 21 days. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, they should do so through the committee staff. Uh, in terms of the audibility of the hearing today, I remind both committee members and witnesses to speak into the microphone. And finally, could everyone please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing. I now welcome our first witnesses. Uh, could each witness, starting from my left, uh, please state their name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation. Okay, my name is Angelo Elliott and I'm the publican at the hotel, uh, Forest in Bixley Hotel, okay. the Friday, and also in the motel as well. Great, thank you. Mr Tully? Oh, sorry. Affirmation? Do you want, wish to do the oath or the affirmation? I do, yes. Yeah. What do I do? Just, just, just read that. Oh, okay. Oath, I swear that evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Mr Tullock? My name is Geoffrey Tullock. I'm the President of the Bexley Chamber of Commerce. My affirmation is that I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Slater. Uh, my name is Arnie Slatini. I'm the owner and operator of Scotts and Kempstein. I swear the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Mr. Tullock, I might just ask that you pull that second microphone towards you as well. Yes, just... Right. Thank you. Good. Uh, fantastic. I'll just also note we've got an apology from the chair, Ms. Abigail Boyd, uh, which is why I'll be chairing the um, hearing today. We might, I might then ask the witnesses to start by making a short statement, just for a couple of minutes, uh, and I'll invite you to do that now, starting with you, Mr. Elliott. Just you're echoing to me, so it's, it's, it's you're, you're echoing, the whole room's echoing when you talk, so, okay. Okay, so what do you want me to I didn't hear what you said. I didn't hear what you said. Okay. All right, Mr. Elliott, if you'd like to make an opening statement. Okay. Uh, I've been in Bexley as, a, as the uh, licensee of the Forest Inn Hotel for 44 years. And um, it was quite a nice place then, or better than it is now. Um, after about 10 years, we, we, the traffic got a little bit more, so we, we, we fought hard to get a Bexley bypass put in. We went to a lot of trouble, a lot of meetings, a lot of everything, a lot of work, 
we got all, all the properties were earmarked for the bypass and then all of a sudden the M5 come along and we all got behind the M5 and that fixed up most of our problems when that happen, happened. But si since now, and then that what's happened with the tolls is that you've really strangled us in that area because there's no one can, there's no parking, um, uh, there's no people, there's no shoppers, the, the shops are all poor and they're all, go <laughs> they're all going broke. I don't know how they even opened. And um, as well as that, I've had to redesign my whole hotel to have reverse it. So the entrances for people to get into was more at the rear than at the front. So we've got the streetscape with all those trucks going past that are just so annoying as they're very off-putting for women that want to drive up there or why would you want to drive up there with all those trucks and that they're scary to drive near those trucks. And, uh, and they drive those trucks like they're sports cars half the time, so it's even more dangerous. And I think we've had a lot of accidents in the area, which, has, which is not good. Now, to me personally, it's been a huge cost because to, to, to um, redesign my pub is really, really expensive. Um, I had to organise uh, parking for my hotel, but there was no parking, so I ended up buying uh, three or four houses on, on the back of the pub so I could supply parking for my customers. Um, that wasn't easy because it wasn't earmarked for parking, so I had to go get a, a zone changed, which, which I did with a great big expense. And when I did that, the council charged me $300,000 after I changed the zoning. As also in the hotel, we supply, uh, we've got about 20, 20 something rooms for budget accommodation for people and with budget meals and things like that. Um, lucky that I have a, a late license that helps me survive uh, through this, this period because no one wants to travel before nine o'clock. It's all, it's, it's too much traffic. You just, you're going to get in your car, you might as well drive the Hurstville or Rock there somewhere else. You, we won't come to Bexley. Um, I, I think that's just really what, what I wanted to say, that it's really killing us, that's all. And, and for the sake of a few dollars, I mean, it's you're killing us with that M5. It's just it's just killing us. Anyway, right. I don't know. But thank you. Thank you for that statement, Mr. Tully. Thank you, Mr. Graham. My concerns relate to Bexley Town Centre roads being used as a free alternative route for the M5 and M8 motorways. On opening of the M8 in June 2020, traffic through Bexley grew instantly to a degree never seen before. This is contrary to one of the key promises of motorways to take traffic away from surrounding streets, not build on it. The alignment and width of our town centre road is essentially unchanged since it was built in the early 1900s. Our traffic is regularly stop-start in nature and our road is a poor choice for the motorway volume of traffic that it presently takes. Motorists diverting through our centre are understandably frustrated with traffic congestion. This is reflected in driving conduct with running of lights, queuing across intersections, erratic lane changing and abusive horn use. Accidents are frequent. This is a day long concern for pedestrians, shoppers and business owners. Shortly before opening of the M8, shopfront parking through our centre was drastically reduced by the introduction of extended no stopping zones at intersections, as well as a bi-directional morning and afternoon clearway. This was clearly a preparation for use as a free motorway alternative and was strongly opposed by the community at large. It's left some businesses as if they were trading on a traffic island. As a condition of approval for the M8, there is a road network performance review plan underway by a consultant to transport for New South Wales. A key part of this is an analysis of traffic impacts to the adjoining road network as a consequence of the M8. Our business community is looking forward to this report, including any proposed mitigation measures for adverse impacts. Finally, I would like to thank committee members for agreeing to meet in Bexley and also allowing me to show them around Bexley earlier today. I'd like to table the document given to members this morning, which contains further details. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. If you could just hand up that document that you're tabling.
and I think on behalf of committee members, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Tullock, for showing us around thank you. Uh, this morning. I think it's certainly been helpful. Uh, Mr. Slatini, I might ask you to also make an opening statement. Yeah. I've been the owner of Scott's Pharmacy for, for about 12 years. In the last eight years, I've been actually living in the area. So I have a bit of, I, I sort of know the area quite well now. Been part of my business, our demographic is a little bit different. We deal with a lot of old and frail people, young families, young children, a lot, a lot of parents that do used to come to us. After the Cleaway is put in, the M8 opened up, a lot of my patients cannot come and see me anymore. They cannot actually walk around where the parking, the council's park uh, has placed, it's just too far for them. And sometimes that was the only time they actually come out and see people and talk to people. Parents are not even coming in because they feel it very unsafe on Forest Road. When you have a 40 ton truck coming straight past their children, they just don't come to the area anymore. Our once thriving baby section, children medicine, has all diminished. We've actually doing a quarter of what we used to do two, three years ago. Even with COVID, pharmacy should have been thriving. We should have been doing major sales because we did not close for one day. When everybody closed, we, was, we stayed open and operating and that still diminished. We just could not bring that back. There was no parents. Every time I spoke to parents, they just do not want to come to the local area. Our elderly population, we had to go and start doing seven days, or six days, I should say, delivery service, because they just could not come and see us. If we didn't do that, we would have lost a good chunk of our business just from that. We could never hold a conversation in the pharmacy and have it as a private conversation anymore. The noise was just so loud. We couldn't say something in, confident, uh, in confidence to them with our other customers hearing. That led us to actually increase our, the thickness of our glass on our front door to make sure we can actually have some privacy. The, that also meant the trucks coming so close to our doors, the sensors went off. And I was actually mentioning it to a lot of the committee members. Th this has not, can I say, this is actually a lot worse than before the M5 opened up. It's a lot worse. We never used to have trucks going flying by and making so much excessive noise. What, what this has happened is it's actually a poisoned, the community has poisoned uh, the local businesses and it's just very unhealthy and very unsafe. Great, thank you for that statement. Uh, we'll now turn to questions. Uh, I might start off just by asking on that question about accidents that uh, a number of you have referred to. You're all uh, living or operating very close to the key intersection here. What have you seen by way of accidents uh, since these changes were made? Mr Elliott or Mr Tullick, perhaps to start? Um, perhaps it uh, might be appropriate for Mr Slotini to answer because he has um, vision of the centre every day. I'm not there all the time. <coughs> Uh, when the clearway started opening up, we've been realising that cars are driving a lot faster through the corridor now. So when there was parking, uh, there was a lot of a bit of a, a bottleneck. So cars were slower, it was safer for pedestrians to cross through. Now when everybody's just zooming past, we've seen people changing lanes, trying to go onto Stony Creek Road and trying to bypass traffic. That's led to one person actually getting killed last year because of that. And only about a few weeks ago, there was something very similar when a car jumped in front of a motorbike and he was severely injured. It's, it's just the pace of the traffic now. It is just, that yeah. people are just going too quick. And they're going around the bends too fast, trucks are going too quick. They're, they're crossing red light count, the red lights now. It's just the wild, wild west out there. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Tullock or Mr. Elliott, do you want to add anything to that? Well, the other thing is that stop start of those trucks in front of our shops. It's noisy, it, it's pollution. I mean, all that pollution finishes up on us. We breathe it and on our food. I mean, when start, people start thinking about that, <laughs> why would they want to come out to see us? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Anyhow, small thing. I can only add what I've, I've spoken of before to see. Um frustration of motorists driving through our centre, coming across intersections, running lights, aggressively changing light, changing lanes. Uh, I have only personally seen one accident, which was a car going inside a truck making a left-hand turn, but I'm aware of many other similar accidents. Some are resulting in um, 
injury, some are not. Uh, but I haven't personally seen the accidents, but I'm certainly aware when they do happen. Thank you. Can I just say one more thing? Sure. With the trucks being so long, they've got a trailer on the back of them now, right? So I've seen <laughs> just a few days ago, one, the, the head of the truck was in front of one set of lights, and the back it was on the other set of lights for the other side of the street. So they were just t too long. So this one truck was blocking two sets of lights and crossings at one time. Mm. It's, it's not built for, for, for those trucks. Nothing okay. is. No, thank you. Mr. Mallow. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for coming along today, and thank you, Mr. Tullock, for the tour this morning and in introducing us to a local coffee shop. I appreciate that. Uh, um, look, I'm totally sympathetic and empathetic to the issue of um, how much stress this traffic causes you. I live in the Blue Mountains, Great Western Highway. Uh, I know trucks and vehicle traffic, but this is going through the heart of a suburban area. Um, I want to just ask you, first of all, Mr. Elliott, did, uh, how long have you owned the hotel for? 44 years. Right. So, um, and I, I, I remember as a young man, before the M5 was opened, struggling out through here to go out uh, to, to go south. Uh, what was it like uh, before the motorway was opened? Did not, uh, no, no, the motorway fixed everything. Yeah. Well, it fixed everything nearly straight away. It's, it's the trucks. Yeah, I'm, getting, like, I'm coming to that. Go, yeah. Even if you go to Newtown where it's just, it's busy, but you it's just cars. You don't see many so semis. So cars no. are not the same mm. as trucks. They're so, and we saw that today. We saw it when we came here in the bus yeah. and we saw it while we were walking around with Mr. Tullock. Um, would uh, a solution, uh, well, first of all, there needs to be research done to see where the trucks are going. But one assumes they're going through the, the semis with the containers, shipping containers going through to the southwest of Sydney not to local businesses, I would assume. That would be correct assumption. Yes? Yeah. So, now North Connects, right? We have a system where trucks that go on the local roads are captured by a camera, and if they exit the local roads at the other end, and they're basically avoiding the toll, the tunnel, North Connects, they get fined, and the fine is greater than the toll. Do you think that approach, if it's able to be done here, would be able to, uh, force the trucks back onto the motorway? I think it'll help, but it's not going to solve the problem because everyone wants to do dodge the tolls, everybody. Well, I don't dodge the tolls and I drive them a lot, but, uh, and, it's quite, you, and the M5 is very busy, I'm sure, but I don't, I don't want to have an argument about yeah, that. No, no, yeah. We always provide a, a toll-free alternative, and of course, that was the case before the M12 uh, was opened, uh, or M8, I think it's called now, sorry, M M12 is out of Battery's Creek, M8. Um, but uh, I mean, the trucks seem to me to be the big problem, and then you could probably address the clearway issue if you could get the trucks out of the suburban, the major suburban road system here. So, is that what we need to be talking about? Well, it would certainly help, but uh, I guess if you're comparing it to what's happened at Pennant Hills, I think that's more containable in the local road network. Yeah. And the question is, if a truck wants to divert around the M5 and the M8, they will go far enough to do so. Um, if they don't divert through Bexley, maybe they'll, they'll divert through other suburbs and um, spread, the, spread the issue elsewhere. Um, to me, the, 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 the real solution is to have a, a very close look at the tolls. And I've always suggested having a, a variable toll structure, perhaps consider having them abolished of a weekend, maybe late at night, uh, so people can have a decent night's sleep and then just have them as full price during perhaps clearway times as a suggestion. Um, yeah, that, that's uh, an interesting suggestion. I mean, uh, overseas, I think in Queensland they have half price truck tolls at night to encourage the trucks to use the night time, the motorways at night. Is that sort of thing? Well, that's, that's true and it's not uh, unusual in Sydney. I, I know that the Sydney Harbour Tunnel has a variable toll system. The Sydney Harbour Tunnel has a variable toll system and, uh, and it, it may encourage people to do their heavy consignments at night through the M5 or the M8 tunnels, uh, thereby saving money. Now you're the President of the Chamber of Commerce. Yes, I am. Uh, uh, has your Chamber made a submission to the Road Performance Review to Transport New South Wales are doing? Uh, I beg your pardon? Are you making a submission or are you engaged with the review that's going on with Transport for New South Wales? Uh, I don't believe it's open for submissions, is it, at this stage? I'm just asking if it's a process that you, 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 you will engage if you can with that. 
the uh, conditions of approval only require consultation with councils. There's no requirement to consult with the community, in my understanding of the conditions of approval. This is the performance review that's going on? The performance review plan, yeah. There might be something that we might talk about then. With the yeah, I council. think um, Bayside Council have written to... Um, let's see if I can find... Uh, the Secretary of the Transport for New South Wales and, and uh, highlighted the fact that consultation at the moment is only with councils and not with the community. Okay. The community would be very interested in com contributing to that review. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Fang. Thank you very much. I appreciate the audio issues we have today, so I'll just make sure that I speak hopefully in a very clear manner. Um, thank you very much for appearing today. And um, I've got a great deal of sympathy for um, what it is that I've heard um, about the issues. I, I think what I would like to do is, um, I guess, understand each of the issues um, in uh, isolation, just so that we can um, look at them and see what impact they might have if we were able to find um, a, a solution to that. So I, I'm. From, from my understanding, it would be that uh, there's issues around parking and the um, ava availability of people to be able to um, find a park and access, for example, the chemist, or, or park and have dinner or a drink. Would that be a fair assumption? Yes, that's true. There's, there's two types of parking that uh, customers in our centre seek. One is perhaps um, off-street larger council parking, which is appropriate for, for people, uh, I suggest, um, um, attending a medical appointment or uh, meeting with their solicitor. There's also uh, shopfront park parking, which is more opportunistic. People passing on their way to work or their way home, want to, wanting to stop for something to eat, go to the bank, go to the post office, go to the pharmacy. Yeah. So I know myself if I'm, if I'm in need of, of shopping, if I'm going through a centre, if I can't find parking immediately, uh, I tend to drive on, uh, especially if I'm unfamiliar with the area. So there are two, two degrees of parking, and we have had some increase in council parking as a result of demolition of a couple of council buildings. So that's been helpful, but not by any means uh, a replacement for shopfront parking. And I know, Mr Elliott, um, you said that you purchased some um, houses that were adjoining your uh, hotel and demolished them in order to increase the off-street parking for your um, uh, patrons. And so that was obviously a cost to you to, uh, to be able to relieve some of that parking load. Um, but uh, that shorter term parking where, you know, you might park to get, pop into the chemist um, on the streets is problematic when it's a clear way. Would that be, and that's reduced, um, that parking's reduced of late, which has created issues. Is that a fair assumption? Well, yeah, that's true. So you, you can't just park and, and pop in and pop out, as to speak. Uh, especially in my industry, you might want to come in for five minutes, pick up your medication and go. That's not even possible anymore. The parking that the council has done is on one side of the uh, town centre too. So it has relieved a bit of pressure, but in reality, it's just outside the centre, um, and it's useless to us, to be honest. Um, yeah. Okay. I see Mr. Yeah, Elliot was... Just, just now I have a, 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 a car park, but now I have a job policing it, because everybody parks in there. Yeah. So who, I've, I've done the, the council's work for them, mm. and I don't want to get in a fight with everybody that wants to park in my park. Thing. Mm. So it becomes more problems again, you know. No, I, I, as I said, I have a great deal of sympathy for the, um, the issues that you um, uh, have as a small business owner. You try to do the right thing and it bounces on you, you know? It's no, no, I, I okay. appreciate that. So I guess the, the parking is, is, is one discrete issue. Mm. That is a result of, I guess, the increased clearways, um, which have been a result of those, that traffic movement that we're seeing through Bexley. Um, what, what was it like before um, those clearways were um, uh, in activation? Um, 
how, how did it differ um, to the way that it is now? I'm just trying to get a picture of, say, um, maybe a decade ago or, or you know, two decades ago. Uh, Mr. Elliott, I know you, you said you've been here 44 years, so you'll be a font of all knowledge of what's happened around this, um, this area. It's, it's varied over the years, but yeah. nothing is as bad as it is now. And, and with, with, with the M5 and no tolls, I mean, with the traffic was less like half as good or even better than half as good. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so Bexley's always had, in my time here, a unidirectional clearway. Yep. We have, uh, we used to have before February of 2020, 40 opportunities for shopfront parking. And under the uh, unidirectional clearway system, we lost half of those in the morning and half in the afternoon. So we always had 20 shopfront more or less shopfront car spaces during the day. With the changes that were introduced in February 2020, under the bi-directional <coughs> clearway system, we lost all shopfront parking morning and afternoon, um, with the extension of no stopping zones at intersections to free the intersections up. We lost a further 24 spaces. So between the morning and the evening uh, clearways, we only had 16 spaces, uh, and previously, by comparison, we had 40. And that's between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m.? That's that? correct, yeah. that's correct, yes. So it gives you a five-hour window where people can actually pop in um, to, to grab the, the scripts or whatever it is that they used to do, but it's outside of those, those peak or hours, yeah. Yes, that's true. And the other, the other point to make is that the, whilst the clearways don't extend to the weekends, the extended no stopping zones do. So we only have um, 24 six, 16, 16 spaces, sorry. we've yeah. lost 24. Yeah. Uh, so we only have 16 spaces shop front at any time maximum, apart from night time, I believe, okay. after seven. So that's the, the issue with the, the clear ways. And then I would guess the third issue would be that the traffic itself is uh, more dense through through Bexley now. Would that be a fair assumption? It's more dense, more aggressive, uh, because noisy. there are more noisy, um, because there are less spaces to park. It's very intimidating to to do a reverse park mm. when there's a truck bearing down on you. Yeah. So. I guess if we break the, down those three issues, that's how I, I look at it. And it's, it's almost been a convergence of, of the three of them. Uh, given that um, we're constrained by buildings that are you know, obviously already there and we're constrained by the hours of operation of peak times, what do you see as a solution um, to resolving um, the issues here. I know you've spoken about the issues around tolling, mm. but do you see any other uh, opportunities that there might be for um, council or the government to work together to try and alleviate some of those issues? Well, I think the true solution would be in reviewing the toll structure to encourage people to use the, these wonderful assets, the M5 and the M8 make them more affordable. Um, Bexley Town Centre goes back to the 1900s, the early 1900s. It's, um, as I said in my submission, it's a very, um, it's a very old road network, very heavily constrained by two major state road intersections at each end, internal pedestrian crossing, bus stops. Uh, traffic is by nature stop start in, in, in characteristics, so so, so short of bulldozing the whole centre, there's not a lot you can do other than discouraging cars from using the centre. Yes, I might uh, just turn... Stop. If we had some really large car parks on the edges of, of, of the car park, it would be fantastic so people could park and then walk into the centre. But someone's got to design that and we've had a hundred years to do that and no one's done, we haven't done anything about it, so it's the way it is. Now it's so expensive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Elliott. I might just turn to that question about the review you've talked about, the road network performance review. This was promised uh, when residents raised concerns about the trucks on 
Forest Road on Stony Creek Road. This was promised within 12 months of the M8 tunnels being open. That was mid 2020, July 2020. Uh, we're now uh, much further on, mid 2022, but there's no sign of that review. Uh, what is going on with this review? How important is it to actually find out what's going on on these roads and what might be possible to do to solve this problem that you're seeing? Well, the, um, my understanding of the conditions of approval is that it requires the network, so road network performance review plan to be commenced within 12 months, but unfortunately there's no time frame for completion of that. The only time frame is for publishing it after consultation with council. Uh, the, I'm just reading through it. If I can just read through clause E40A, um, which I'm happy to table as well. Um, one of the things required of the review plan was an updated analysis, including modelling of traffic impacts to the adjoining road network, in brackets, including impacts on local roads or rat running. And many, uh, many people, especially motorists, don't like that term rat running, but it's interesting that the, the approval does actually refer to that. Uh, so that's the most important thing for us, the quantification, I guess, of the impact of people driving around or using, using local streets as a free alternative for the M5 and M8. And, and that will be very telling, I think, once the results come through. Yeah, so as you've pointed out, that was a requirement of the uh, approval conditions. But when residents have written to the government, they've been told this would be released 12 months after the M8 opened. That hasn't happened. I understand. Um, how important is it to see this uh, plan, this review in public? Is that one of the things that the committee could do uh, to support your concerns about these trucks on suburban streets? It certainly would be because uh, the conditions of approval also include uh, analysis of potential mitigation measures for any impact on local roads. So certainly an answer sooner rather than later would be better, but uh, keeping in mind, of course, that COVID has confused traffic through our area. And what you saw this morning is perhaps not um, traffic at its peak. It's mm -hmm. People are still going back to work. Mr. Sotini or Mr. Elliott, any views on that review? Yeah, it is very important to have that review because after 12 months, well, once the M8 opened, we, you put a toll on the M5 that was never there. It was built for free for the, for the public to use. And then all of a sudden, we get a clear way and the M5 gets tolled. And then Bexley and Uncliffe and Beverly Hills all got uh, penalised for what the government has done. And that's not, that's not our fault. We live in an area that had a nice good village atmosphere. We had good, good flow of traffic, parking. It, it was a great place to be and great place to, sh to, to shop. Then all of a sudden we get penalised and we get shafted because of what the government decided to do with the M8, Transurban, whatever the deal was. Uh, and we're paying the cost. So the review is actually very, very important. We want to know what's going on. Yeah. One view that's been put publicly is that it's almost like going back to the future, to before the M5 East existed as a road. It isn't really, you've got to rewind back 20 years mm -hmm. uh, to see this many trucks yeah. coming through the centre of Bexley. Uh, is that an accurate view? It's, it's relatively accurate, but in, in my observation, I would say traffic is much worse than what it was prior to the opening of the M5 in 2000. I believe it was 2000, maybe 2001. Sydney has grown in the last two decades. Mm. So there's a lot more trucks and a lot more of everything going through. There's a lot more people living out west. There's a lot of more traffic flow that needs to go through Bexley now. Mm. So. Yeah, but the promise of these toll roads though was it would take trucks off suburban streets and into the toll road tunnels. The opposite seems to have happened here. Um, one of the views is that it's been put to us by some of the freight companies is simply that the price is wrong uh, to get those trucks in the tunnels. Uh, Mr Tullock, you've put some views to us about that already. Um, do you agree here 
one of the issues is the price that's been struck to drive through the M8 tunnel or on the M5 East seems to be wrong, and that's one of the reasons why these trucks are on suburban streets. Well, I, I, I believe that's quite correct, and, and um, if one motorway opens with a toll uh, and a defined route or alternative uh, to that toll, perhaps that can be accepted by the community. But when one motorway opens and you all of a sudden have a toll on two motorways, one that was always free, although very congested, it's a double whammy effect. So you're getting people who had used the M5 and people who would have used the M8 now diverting through the streets of Bexley. And there's no other way they can really go other than through Bexley. It is on a major, uh, or two major intersections. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Slatini or Mr. Elliott, did you want to comment on? Um... No, I agree with him. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. No, very good. Uh, Mr. Rath. Um. <coughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I was just wondering about the, uh, obviously the new roads EM8. Uh, do you think that eventually when the, well, I don't know if you've looked into this, when the M8 uh, and M5 connect up to the M4, the sort of missing link part of it, um, would that change the traffic flow at all? The West connects the final bit of West connects? Because at the moment, the sort of M8 sort of just comes to a, an end, um, but that's not Chris, where I think it's all in. about the money. What's sorry? It's the money, it's the toll. Mm. That's what's killing it, really. Yes, It's yeah, the toll. It doesn't matter how far they've got to drive, it's the toll. But it won't it make it, the traffic flow better if at the moment, instead of the M8 and M5 sort of coming to an end, that they can link up to the M4 as part of West Connects. Well, because it, at the moment the, the, the network's not fully complete, so it might only be um, a short-term problem, as, as bad as it is. Well, I think as uh, Mr. Elliott says, that the, the, the question comes down to tolling. I don't know if there's been any consideration as to how much the toll will be mm. to go from, say, Beverly Hills to, you said the M4, I think, to, in the closing link. Um, to use the M8 at the moment, from King George's Road is close to $10 each way. And if you're adding another $10 to that to get to the M4, it's $20 each way mm. per day, per motorist. Uh, and as I said to some of the members on our walk around, you have to remember that a lot of people using the M5 and the M8 are coming from southwestern Sydney, where they've moved to be able to afford real estate. And for them, an extra $100 a week is a big deal. That's after tax. Um, it may or may not have an impact, but I, I do firmly believe that it depends on the toll that's been charged. Is, is, do you think there's any opportunity on the, on the M5 and M8 to, um, in terms of the exits, um, to try to direct traffic onto the toll road rather than people, you know, in particular trucks trying to bypass the toll road. Because obviously we would like to see the trucks stay on the toll road rather than avoid it, but through Im improved, you know, signage, exits, etc. Is there any way of redirecting the trucks back onto, onto the toll road? Chris, they're just avoiding the toll, Chris. That's what they're doing. Mm. No matter how you say it to me, you can go the cheapest way. Yeah, that's the way I think. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. Everybody tries to earn a living, so no matter what you do, what you, if they can save a hundred dollars, like what Jeff just said, a, a week, why not? Mm. Let's, let's um, be frank. I mean, again, I travel M5. A lot I used to work in Liverpool. I mean, right now we're down the M5. There's a tremendous number of semi-trailers and container trucks in there using it still. So it's a minority that are. Uh, I mean, it's annoying. It's a problem. So we've seen it, but I mean the M5 is, and the, new, the, 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 the tunnels are functioning, diverting huge volumes of trucks out of the suburban areas. It used to, years ago, go through here all the time. It's horrible. Um, so we've got to address this minority of trucks 
that are avoiding the toll, because the majority are using the, the, the motorways. Uh, you go down there now, it's full of semi-trailers and shipping containers going through those tunnels. But we've got to work our way to address the minority. It comes back to what I talked about before, some sort of gantry system that puts in a penalty, but and hopefully this, this study will look at that. We acknowledge there's a problem, but it is a minority of trucks that are doing it. You, you, you're presenting a position that sounds like all the trucks are not going in the tunnel. I'll tell you, it's packed full of trucks. It's a very viable transport solution. We're just going to address this minority. Do you agree with that general no. uh, observation? No, no, I don't agree with that. that well, totally if you close the tunnels then, you'd have 10,000 well, trucks an hour. Well, the government, why did the government put a clearway in throughout the whole forest road? Oh, that's a good question. So they, they knew very well what's going to happen and what's going to happen to the uh, communities Planned there. They knew, they planned it from the beginning or they, comp well, they knew what's going to happen once the tolls went in. Mm -hmm. That's why we got the clearways. Is that not correct? Yeah. No, I don't know the answer but, to that question. Good yeah, question. But we'll one would assume that that would be correct. So. We'll ask that. <coughs> we, uh, ask them. we might also ask the council because council is usually engaged in those decisions, but uh, it's a very good question. But you're, I think, you're saying I think, before I think that you've got a point there. I mean, most trucks do use that, but the do blokes the that just can't afford it will go the way that they can afford. It's as simple as that. Mm. It still goes to what they can afford to do. Like, if he comes, they're paying it, they're paying it, they just pass the cost on. But not everyone can do that. Yeah, not everyone is in that position. So you, you were saying before that you almost want a bottleneck. Sorry? You, you, you were saying before you want a bottleneck to exist so that the cars are, and trucks are slower. That's what you said before, that you almost, you almost want the clearways to be removed. Um, which will create a bottleneck, and then as a result, all of the vehicles will be travelling at a much slower pace. Is that? Is that? What you, I think that's what you said before. Oh, I think that may have been Mr. Slotini. Yeah. No, no, well, not not much of a bottleneck to slow down. We, we do want traffic to slow down a little bit, but we wanted them to. We wanted the parking back. Now, what is the speed limit on those roads? Sixty. Fifty. Sixty. Sixty. Would you support reduction? I mean, the city of is down to forty. King Street gets down to 40. Uh, you know, uh, Blue Mountains where I live goes up and down. We're constantly looking at the speedometer, but it's, generally speaking, it's 50, 60 sometimes. Shane, the worst part is that stopping and starting. That's yeah. the worst. No, I Breaking and stopping and starting. That's and stopping and starting. You know, like that's 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 the most annoying, isn't it? Uh, Mr. Mallard, I don't think they could reach 60 kilometres an hour through our centre no. because of the the two major intersections, the internal pedestrian crossing, bus mm. stops, and so on. I really don't think a truck could get up that fast through our centre, so reducing the speed is... It was flying fairly freely this morning when we inspected with It certainly you. was, yeah. 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 The, the intersections were functioning quite well. They weren't blocking across intersections this morning. Though our bus went across, uh, you know, they got caught on um, the Princess Highway down that end. That was pretty heavy. Yeah. Uh, down the, the airport end there. Yeah. Okay. Mr. <coughs> Thank you. Um, th this may or may not be a question that you can answer, but I've just been doing a little bit of, uh, you know, back of the napkin research. And I'm wondering, um, just having had a look at the, the, the tolls um, between, say, the entry of the M5 to um, King George's Road on that new M5 East section, it's about $27 if you're a truck, if you went the whole distance. Um, I, I know personally when I do, I, I, I live in the regions, I use the M5 to go home a lot and that tunnel was basically standstill from, you know, sun up to sun down. But it's obviously improved now that the M8's um, opened. I wonder if anybody has actually done the calculations as to how much a vehicle, whether it be a car or a truck, would save by actually using the tunnel um, with the um, less uh, uh, fuel use, given that you're not sitting and idling um, as much, and also um, perhaps less maintenance, given that it's, it's more free-flowing, less work on the brakes, etc. Has anybody um, dis discussed it with you, or um, do you have any um, idea of how much time is spent travelling through the Bexley route that you are on versus what you would have done on the tunnel and how much in, in, in a dollar sense that would actually be costing to avoid the toll? I'm personally not aware of, of costing, but I would imagine it would have been covered in a cost-benefit analysis as part of the environmental impact statement. 
uh, which either justified or uh, uh, ruled out the possibility or the, the construction of the motorway. So my answer is I'm not aware of what, what the savings would be. Yeah. Are you able to sort of have an indicative time frame difference between, say, if you were to um, enter the M5 tunnel um, at, at the start near the airport and then coming out at King George's Road versus the time that you would um, take from the same position um, coming through Bexley, I'm assuming, um, up to King George's Road and then about to the same point. Do you, do you have any diff idea of the difference of the time? Uh, given that I'm not a local and I don't travel that route very often. Depends what time of day too. Yes, no, and, that, and that's the other thing I was about to address. Yeah. Do you have, like, would it be about 10 minutes, 15 minutes extra, do you think? Or normally, probably, 10 minutes. Mm. Yeah. Motorways certainly would be much more expensive. Um, Is your 10 minutes worth the toll? I, yeah, I know. I know talking to um, members of our group who are more time poor and perhaps more uh, more able to do so, they're quite happy to pay the toll. Um, I just wonder if it's perhaps... Um, it feels like a saving, but perhaps the, the, the saving isn't quite... The, the full $27, given the extra time that they spend um, travelling through Bexley, given the um, extra um, fuel use, given the start and stop, and we all know that you know a flowing a, a vehicle that's you know at a constant speed uses a lot less fuel than a vehicle that's starting and stopping. Um, perhaps it's also about an education process from the government side to um, advise people how much they would um, be saving um, in time and money mm. should they actually go through the tunnel. And that would assist um, your, um, your area. Would that be a, a reasonable thought? That's a very good point, Mr Fang. I think if, um, in the light of increasing petrol and diesel prices, truck drivers in particular could be convinced that it's much cheaper to travel via motorways than not, um, maybe you can convince them to to use motorways. And that's the thing, isn't it? At the moment, that price of fuel, you know, petrol or diesel, whatever it is that you operate, is quite high. And also the time of day, as you said, Mr. Elliot, it, 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 the, the traffic on the road can, can vary quite considerably. You could actually potentially save a lot more as, around those peak hours if you were to use um, perhaps uh, the motorways. Um, I was just curious as to anyone, if anyone had spoken to you about it, because um, just by looking at it and looking at the aerials, I would think that it's, you know, at least a 10 or 15 minute, if not more, detour around. And, um, you know, when you're talking about, you know, hours, dollars per hour of operation of some of these larger vehicles, I would have thought that that would make it much more cost effective to go through the motorway. Mm. But um, uh, I'm sure, Chair, you've got some more questions that you'd like to sure. um, I might just return to that question about the road network performance review. You've said that it's very important. That study uh, is necessary. You'd like to see the results. Um, it's nearly 12 months late now. Uh, have you, any of you been given any indication about when that review will be released? Do you have any idea about the timing? Uh, we've had no correspondence with um, Transport for New South Wales um, or any other government body telling us when the timing may be. Yeah, thank you. And my colleague asked about um, consultation, consultation with the community. Uh, is that, I think you've signalled you'd be very open to engaging in that consultation. If you were given the chance to provide your input directly into that <coughs> review, you'd be happy to do so and let the community of Bexley and surrounds have their say through that process. I cer certainly would be personally, and I'm sure the overall business and residential community would as well. Thank you. And um, when, just returning to that issue about the clearways, um, the, uh, as my colleague again has pointed out, often there'd be consultation with the councils uh, before a decision like that was made, and we'll certainly put that question to the councils. Mm. Uh, in terms of the local community though, when those clearways were driven through, when those uh, 40 parking spaces that were so fundamental to uh, people coming to visit your businesses were made. Uh, was there any consultation with your businesses or with the community? 
Yes, there was. There was, uh, was actually a two-stage process. The uh, initial proposal, to be honest, was for a 12-hour clearway on both sides, which was strongly opposed by the business community and by Bayside Council, as well as our members for Rockdale and Cogra. So what is it now? Is it four or five hours? What, how many hours is it clearway? It's just, it, it had just basically gone from what was a unidirectional clearway to a bi-directional clearway. Yeah, how many hours? Is it like 7 a.m. to 10 a.m.? Or I, I believe it would have been 7 till 10. Oh, yeah. And then in the afternoon again, 3 to 6 or something? Is that 3 to 7. Yeah, yes. okay, I think, yes, that's right. Yeah. But it was going to be 12 hours, so that's a big difference. I believe yeah. it was going to be 12 hours. I don't have the document in front of me, but, uh, but due to community concern and uh, yeah. rejection of the proposal, it was watered down. That's a big difference. Yeah. And as a... Uh, as an addition, the uh, uh, extension of no stopping zones were introduced as well. Right. So, in, in answer to your question, there were there was consultation with the community, uh, which was uh, reported by the authority at the time. Thank you. And I, I might, Ms. Mr. Slatini, did you want to contribute oh, there? No. Yeah. no. I might just finally ask about um, the businesses, um, you've talked about how hard it is to operate businesses under these conditions. I might just ask, have we seen businesses close? Have we seen uh, an impact on how easy it is or, or uh, how long it's taken to uh, get people into some of these uh, businesses now along these roads that have been affected? When people open a business, start a business, they do everything they can to, to make it survive. They borrow from banks, from friends, from family, they forego holidays, they forego luxury. So when adverse conditions come up, they don't close their business immediately. There have been business closures, but to be honest, I couldn't honestly say if they were a result of the traffic conditions or a result of COVID or part of a natural succession. We have about 140 shopfront businesses in Bexley and I'd say that vacancy rate's probably around about 10 per cent. The more telling point is once a property is vacant, uh, the time taken to lease it and the conditions that the, uh, the future tenants are seeking. Uh, feedback to me from local real estate agents is that potential tenants are being tougher in the deals they strike they're uh, paying less money for a lease, they're going to shorter lease periods, uh, and just basically putting the risk back on the landlord. All right, thank you. Was there anything either of the other witnesses wanted to add? Well, all I just want to add up to that comment is all the businesses in Bexley actually had to work really, really hard to survive in the last two years. Everybody had to almost reinvent themselves um, so everybody's doing extra hours, doing extra services just to bring back the customers again. Like yeah. what uh, Angelo had done and put the car parks behind him and it got great expense for himself. We actually had to put extra delivery services and phone consults that we've never had to do. And every other business is doing the same as us, mm. just to survive again. Yeah. Mm. All right. Thank you. Um, if, unless there's any other um, questions from our committee members, what I might do is... Um, bring this session to a close. Our next witnesses are here. I want to thank you for attending the hearing. The evidence you've given us uh, has been particularly helpful to the, uh, to the committee. We've come out here because of the evidence we've received about the M5 corridor in particular. So I thank you for the evidence. Also, Mr Tullick, for uh, showing the committee around. I thank you again for um, your assistance so we can see directly. Uh, thank you for coming on. to Bexley. And I, I, I will say, Mr Chair, I should have said this, uh, Minister, Minister Natalie Ward, the new Minister for Urban Roads, is aware we're here today and uh, asked us to come along and make sure we heard your views and we'll relay them directly to her. So I'll assure you of that as well. Right. Thank you, Mr thank you. All right. Thank you for your evidence. And I, might ask, I might just ask those people at the back of the room, uh, given the audio issues we're having, just for a bit of quiet. <laughs> Uh, so I might welcome our second set of witnesses and ask you, starting from my left, to please state your name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation.
And that would be me first, wouldn't it? Yes, your left. Correct. As opposed to my left, thank you. Um, Sue Weatherly, I'm the Director of City Strategy and Innovation at George's River Council, and I'll be swearing the oath. Um, I swear that the evidence now about, now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Great, thank you. Good morning, my name's Jeremy Morgan. I'm Manager of City Infrastructure for Bayside Council. And I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence given now, about to be given by me, shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Great. Thank you. I might ask you firstly, if you'd like to make an opening statement, uh, I'll invite you first to do so, Ms Weatherly. Um, and thank you very much uh, to the Chair and the Committee for the opportunity to present today. Um, and I suppose I may, I'm not going to feel as though I'm going to be an outsider in this conversation today, because I'd be here encouraging the committee to think broadly about road pricing and how it is used to fund infrastructure and better manage traffic in a fair and equitable way. Any discussion to do tolls for road use should properly be a discussion about transport and traffic in our city and how best to meet the increasing needs with a comprehensive conversation about road pricing. Sydney has the most congested roads in Australia. Two of those roads pass through George's River, um, King George's Road, which is the A3 corridor, and Silverwater Road, which is the A6 corridor. Therefore, these are important issues for the George's River community. In New South Wales, we've almost exclusively used tolls as a road pricing mechanism, and these tolls have been used to fund um, the construction of almost exclusively for new roads. And the problem with this is it becomes the reason to build new roads when investment in integrated transport solutions for freight and people movement is required. Building more roads will rarely solve congestion problems and when the method of road pricing becomes part of the decision making for building that road, our transport decisions can be skewed. Placing tolls on some roads may encourage the wrong outcomes, with drivers diverting to local streets to avoid roads, creating local congestion, which I assume is what the previous um, people giving evidence spoke about and the impact on um, their local businesses. Tolls are also inherently inequitable, with some commuters able to do all necessary travel without using toll roads as the roads have been funded by a broad tax base, or they are able to use alternate travel methods such as rail while others, especially the um, communities of, on the outer areas of Sydney, have little option but to regularly use roads where, they, roads where they must pay a toll. Why is the cost of using some roads but not others? Why have we decided that some users, in particular the current generation, have to pay for roads that will also be used by future users of those roads? International and even some more local exam examples demonstrate that putting a price on roads will change behaviour and therefore the challenge for New South Wales is to ensure that this is the behaviour we want. There are many world examples of other mechanisms of road pricing. Um, distance and time-based fees, lowering off-peak areas, higher road charges in an area where there are public transport options, for example, lower charges on motorways and high, higher charges on local streets. Congestion charges and charging all users based on the distance and roads used. In the past, a simple flat toll on certain roads was the only practical solution we had to road pricing. But technology provides us with a whole suite of other solutions to managing both congestion and also funding future infrastructure. I don't propose there is a one size that fits all solutions, but there is a need for a more comprehensive and equitable approach to the way we go about um, road pricing. Thank you for that statement. I might ask you, Mr Morgan, if you would like to make thank a statement you. as well. So, thank you, Chair and Committee members, for the opportunity to, to appear before you today. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Jeremy Morgan and I'm appearing on behalf of Bayside Council. Uh, in my capacity as Manager of City Infrastructure, I have direct oversight of our Traffic and Road Safety team. And I've also had the opportunity to sit on Council's M5 East Traffic Management Working Party as technical lead. Central to the Bayside local government area is a major logistics and transport hub. We're home to Sydney Airport and a substantial part of Port Botany. Bayside is a node for the movement of people and goods around New South Wales, Australia and internationally. 
Motorway linkages are key to this connectivity. The M5 East, M8 and the future M6 toll roads all, in, all intersect the Bayside area. Council officers have heard from representatives of the elected council, business owners, the Bexley Chamber of Commerce and residents about the negative impacts to our local area following the introduction of tolls on the M5 East in 2020. My team has fielded many petitions, emails, phone calls from people negatively impacted by increased traffic on alternate toll-free roads throughout Bayside. We've seen significant changes in the volumes and mix of traffic um, on numerous roads. There is a noticeable increase in heavy vehicle traffic. I've read the terms of, uh, terms of reference for this inquiry into road tolling regimes and I encourage you to consider the costs associated with toll avoidance. Our community has laid witness to the traffic diverting from the M5 East since 2020 onto alternate toll-free routes like Stony Creek Road, Forest Road and Bexley Road to name a few. Toll avoidance brings costs on alternative routes associated with noise insulation for homes and businesses, repairs to property from vibration damage, accelerated road deterioration, increased accidents, rat running through our residential areas, increased congestion and travel delays for local trip generation, general reduction in amenity and loss of convenient on-street parking and local shopping strips. We're, we often hear that tolled or untold, the choice is yours. It's an approach that relies on motorists selecting a toll road option based on travel time savings compared to toll free roads. During morning peak, and this is using the Linkst website, during morning peaks, a time saving of six minutes on the nine and a half kilometre section of M5 East comes at a cost of $7.52 for a car or $22.56 for a truck. For those that can't afford the additional costs, and that's each way, they divert to toll-free surface roads where our local community bears the cost of their choice. Bayside Council simply wants to see motorways that are designed and constructed to improve transport efficiency used for their intended purpose. We want to see genuine incentives for using motorways and deterrence for using local connections. We want to see local roads return to local communities, improving air quality, road safety and reducing congestion and noise. Thank you. Thanks for those opening statements. I might turn now to questions from the committee and I'll call Mr Mallard. Well, thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you both for coming in today uh, and presenting to us. Um, were you here during the last session, I think? I was a little bit, but you... I, I I think did, I'm sure, Mr Morgan, you're very familiar, you're very versed with the views of your okay. Chamber of Commerce. You're a good um, council... Uh, Excellent local representative. ...public service. Yes, indeed. Um, the, first of all, uh, uh, Ms Weatherly, uh, look, uh, totally, I'm on board on your opening statement regarding you know, the whole nature of uh, road pricing and the macro opportunities. Uh, we're here looking at... Uh, the localised problem here and uh, trying to drill down on, on um, what, what, what should be the approach. I mean, we've, we've, had, uh, we've heard from other inquiries, other uh, witnesses in the past about re-looking re at toll structures and we've ruled out a congestion tax, let's just make that clear, it's political reality. But I want to ask um, m more specifically around uh, what engagement the council has had with uh, the state government over, over period of time, not just now but in the past, regarding local traffic management plans and, and then from that leading to how, how is the council engaged in regards to the changes to intersections and parking and, uh, and removal and no standing and clearways. Can you go through that process for us? Um, I'll do very quickly. Um, oh, because, then take your time. Yeah, um, principally because um, the issue in terms of that people behaving in response to a price and therefore diverting into local roads is generally an issue in more in Bayside than it is in George's River. Um, certainly all the data we have doesn't indicate any significant change to the traffic levels in, on George's River roads, but sometimes the boundaries are very, you know, you know it's just a line on a map, but mm. it hasn't been significant. Um, and in the, in, in the time since the tolls were introduced, we've only had, well, we've had one complaint, which really was probably wasn't about the tolls. The biggest impact has been in Bayside. Yeah. And so I will pass it on, but if I may, because 
you acknowledge my broader comment, mm. solve, be careful solving a problem and creating another one. There is a local issue here. Mm. Um, North Connects, which I know quite well, I live out that way. Um, that process of saying it's a whole lot more expensive to use local roads for, for trucks than it is to use um, the tunnel, you know, that may be a solution here, but again, just needs to be tested. That's that issue of saying tolls are cheaper and quicker, but not much. And my final comment would make the proposal to extend the F6 is touted as this magnificent improvement to road transport. It saves five minutes. Hmm. So it's, it's an issue about we've got to be very careful about the roads we're investing in as well. Hmm. Uh, Mr Morgan, could you perhaps just step us through briefly the sure. history of engagement in regards to you know, the, the, sure. the local traffic management in conjunction with the infrastructure? Sure. So Transport for New South Wales officers have been um, engaging with council officers over a number of years about different improvements right throughout the Bayside area. So things like clearways, the clearway programs, um, the congestion improvement, so where they modify intersections, they certainly have been, we are aware that they've been looking at lots of options over the last couple of years. Um, and they have actually undertaken several, um, several projects to improve and reduce congestion and re um, improve traffic flow. So are they acknowledging that the um, toll avoidance has created a problem? Or, I mean, to be frank, I remember these roads before the M5 has even built the first tunnel, but it was just, you know, horrendous like the old Parramatta Road, just trucks back bumper to bumper all the time, never moving. So is this a legacy traffic issue still? Because these are pretty seriously major roads through your community, or, or is it caused by avoidance, or is it a bit of both? No, so most of the projects I'm speaking about were projects identified prior to M5 East tolls introduced. So a lot of the analysis goes back several years. So on roads like uh, Rocky Point Road, Forest Road, Stony Creek Road. So it was, it was prior to M5 East okay. tolls. You, um, no, and just like taking out parking, I, I was a councillor for 12 years, you probably know that. Uh, the council's traffic management committee was always the, the holy grail with the traffic planners. I recall parking spots being removed or clearways being changed, always went through that process. The cop police were there, the council was there, the state government was there, RMS had a veto power on those committees. If they're still the same, I don't know. Did, you, did that process go through, even just as a cons consultation regards to intersections and stop, you know, no standings being put in and some parking being removed? Was that a so process? In terms of the consultation through a local traffic committee, because most of the roads we're talking about are state roads, mm. the local traffic committees are not delegated to consider state roads. So most of that consultation has been not through the traffic committee, it's been direct approach. Um, and it's more, it's often more notification than engagement. So it's notifying that there will be some public engagement on the proposals. Um, we certainly have seen some background studies that um, gave the justification to transport to consider some of these parking restrictions, um, looking at travel time delays uh, during certain days of the week. So. So I noted this morning, I said to the witness earlier, that uh, we went for a walk and frankly, the traffic was flowing pretty smoothly. Even big trucks that clearly shouldn't be on these streets were, it was moving quite well, wasn't uh, congested heavily. Does that mean those improvements have had a, a, a benefit to moving traffic through the area? I, look, I would say, um, yes, they have. So there certainly has been introduction of um, parking restrictions which has eased congestion through some of these centres mm. um, and traffic is moving uh, freer but I guess the issue is that we're seeing the increase in traffic as well so um, I guess to add to your earlier question about some of those parking restrictions being brought in before the M5 tolls it kind of freed up some extra capacity so we are seeing the traffic move but that is come at the cost of the on-street parking. I've got two more questions although I think we've got you for an hour so we'll probably have plenty of time but my you mentioned the, you, that you were a member of the, sorry, um, a, a, a technical group. A, 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 what was that called again? The M5 East Traffic Management Working Party. So that was a, a party formed by council. Okay, so the state represented on that? No, they weren't. It was a 
a local council committee with uh, councillor representatives, local chamber of commerce and some community members. So you, you feed your views back into the state government, either via your MP or via direct? Yes, we did. Okay, all right. The other one was, are you, um, the road network performance review, yes. which I'm told is underway, but we've got a different view on the committee apparently. Um, are you engaged with that? So we have had a briefing from Transport for New South Wales on some of the early um, data that they've, had, they've gathered. Um, and they have asked us to provide some comments on that, but it's, at this stage, um, it appears the report is not finalised, it's still in, in draft. So, so they engaged you, you didn't make a submission, council didn't make a submission to it, it's not that no, type of process? No, we were, we're actually given five days to, to make comment. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I'm very short time frame. Sure, you had cut and paste pretty quickly. Yes. All right, that's enough for me now, I might have some more later on. Thank, Thank you. you. I might stay with that issue about the uh, road network performance review. So this is nearly a year late uh, after residents were promised this would be released. So you're saying that this review, which has taken two years, um, which should have taken 12 months, you were given five days as a council to comment. Yes, that's correct. So we're, we met with Transport for New South Wales. They provided a briefing, uh, offered five days to comment. Um, at the time, it was uh, school the, just before school holidays were about to commence. They did extend that period for us to comment for an additional five days, five business days. Um, but yes, it was a very short time frame to, to yeah. respond. And what, uh, you've said that you don't know when that'll be uh, released. Um, it's in draft form at the moment. Can you give us any sense of when that might be released? Have you been given any indication? <laughs> No, we have actually that asked that released. question. We have asked for when that's likely to be released. Um, I guess from, from my perspective, something that the, the, M5E's, um, sorry, the, the M5E's Traffic Management Working Party had requested was engagement with the community. Um, when we met with Transport, they made it very clear that that was not part of the plan preparation. Um, we think that is... Um, huge disbenefit to the local community. They have a lot of input that they would like to share um, and that's not part of that plan. Yeah. Uh, so if the chance was there for the community to contribute, your view is that it'd certainly be very welcome? I, yes, absolutely. Council has that view that it should be open to the, the public to comment on this review plan. Yeah. And Ms Wedley, I might just turn to you on that set of questions about the network performance review, uh, would you, what would you like to um, contribute on this uh, question? So we've had um, the same sort of initial briefing on, on that, which was indicating no significant change to the traffic levels on the key roads through George's River, but certainly from a point of view of the local community, making sure um, their input is also considered, I think, it's absolutely important. And as with sometimes as this happens, a local government feels we've perhaps not given quite enough time to respond to matters, particularly if we think it's a matter that needs input from the elected councillors and all our community. So I think that's, this is such a sensitive issue, particularly in and around um, Bexley, I think not to do so um, would cause far more angst than, you know, sometimes it's better to take an extra two months and get it right than rush it through and miss that opportunity to engage with the community. And this, again, I'll ask you, this is nearly a year late after when it was promised. Do you know when this review will actually um, I, I don't. Then? I don't have that information, no. Um, I'm only aware of the initial briefing at the same yeah. time that Bayside received theirs. And when did that interim briefing take place? How long ago was that? Uh, I haven't got the exact date. It would have been the last school holidays. I don't know what that date was. Is that in March or? March, April. Yeah. yeah. Great. If, perhaps if you take that on notice, yes, okay. yes, take that, that'd be helpful for the committee. I might just ask you, I mean, obviously there are increasingly toll roads all around Sydney, but it really is in this area that we've seen this issue be most severe. I think that's fair. We haven't seen these issues in uh, other uh, bits of the community where there's been toll roads to this degree. It's really been these communities that have been most impacted by this issue about suburban streets being flooded with trucks after the toll roads open, the opposite of what was promised. Why do you think it's worse here uh, compared to 
other areas in I Sydney. Think so. And then I'll invite committee members to respond. But, uh, so it always was, a, always was a truck route that's but a problem. Perhaps first, Mr Morgan. Yeah, sure. In, in my opinion, I think it's a combination of factors. The, the fact that we're so close to some of those logistics hubs where the, uh, the initial nodes are located within the area. And secondly, that, that it was previously untold. So they've seen, um, I guess motorists are not seeing that, that benefit for the, that cost that we've discussed that I've mentioned this morning, they're probably not seeing the, the benefits. They're choosing to go the alternate routes. Because mm. when you add that, that cost, particularly for, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about heavy vehicles, the cost for trucks moving from Port Botany to the west, when we're talking you know, an extra $20, $22.50 each way, each trip, when they're doing multiple trips per day, um, I think that has a, a big impact on their choice of diverting to an alternate. Mm. Ms. Weber. I, um, I probably would agree with um, Jeremy on that, that the is issue is really a case of the cost-benefit analysis and a direct price is, more, is always seen by consumers in a different way. If you have to put your hand in your pocket almost immediately to pay as opposed to long-term savings. And I would also suggest that if I'm, I've never been a truck driver, but you know, the, the thought processes or I'm the operator of the logistics firm, I'm going, so I'm saving 10 minutes, but I can't use that 10 minutes in another way. I, I'm making five trips a day, that's how many I need to make. Saving 10 minutes doesn't mean I can make six if I haven't got business with six trips. I'm not actually, I can't, rec I can't make that money back. So I'd be interested to see how people, how the firms actually think about it in terms of the cost. Mr. And I think that was sort of the point that I was covering off earlier with um, the witnesses, uh, that um, there's clearly a time saving, um, and I suspect there's also a operational cost saving by using the motorways over the surface roads, but it's that um, immediacy of having the tolls taken out of your account versus the longer term wear, tear um, and uh, I would say um, operational fuel cost um, uh, savings that, that aren't really factored in. Just in relation to um, some of the figures, Mr Morgan, I noted in your opening statement you said about nine minutes was the saving. Uh, it was nine and a half kilometres but it was six minutes and that was, oh, using, six minutes, sorry. That right. was using the links. Uh, yeah. website. So that's on the that's on the uh, M5 East component, is that what yes. you were saying? So that's between King George's Road and Marsh Street. Yeah. So I checked that again this morning, it's 10 minutes at the moment. So it does vary depending on time of day. Yeah. And I think that's probably part of uh, that education process that we have to um, uh, impart to people is that um, at t different times of day and, and different surface settings, um, the the time taken will cost, um, will take longer and, and the savings perhaps aren't as great. But um, just turning I think to um, the recognition that the surface roads have largely been in place, I'll say, since um, the development of, of these areas, you know, with, they tend not to move, um, you know, houses and lots are sold and then that's your, your boundary and you're really constricted um, you know, by the road um, uh, distance you can have because of those um, physical property boundaries. So it's one of those instances where we see, um, for example, in the Sydney CBD now, where um, cycleways are going in, we're losing a lane to traffic. So no, just parking. it's, it's um, it, what it what it does is it, it means that we're um, we're constricting the, the traffic into small areas to then allocate something else. It would be the same here if we were to do um, changes around the road surfaces. We're really constricted by what we've got. Noting that there's been a lot of commentary about the increased traffic here. Have you had any projections as to what the traffic and surface roads will look like in, say, uh, a decade, 25 years, 50 years, 100 years? Obviously, it's hard to predict, but if we go back 100 years, 
um, it was a, certainly a different um, uh, outlook to what we're seeing now. Um, I just wonder if, uh, if there's an opportunity to make things better or if, if it is just going to get worse from now. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, yes, I do have some thoughts around that, certainly. Um, I guess in terms of um, looking at traffic generation over time, um, there's a number of things that get factored into that. Um, certainly the, the increase in population in a certain area, uh, background traffic increases. So there, there is certainly factors that we look at in terms of um, estimating the increase in traffic over time. Um, but that also needs to coincide with other um, transport improvements, so public transport, um, having building centres around um, destinations so that people have less distance to travel. So keeping the, you know, the, the idea of the 30 minute city for the Greater Cities Commission. Um, so there's a lot of factors to include. I guess, um, you know, over time, yes, there will definitely be more traffic, um, but you know, trying to manage that with other, um, other strategies to reduce the demand on, on cars. So can I offer a positive future? Because I think, um, I think we've moved to a situation where technology provides far, a whole lot of solutions in this area. Um, also to encourage the, I mean, I'm a, I'll talk forever, if you build more roads, you get more cars. But we also need to provide a sufficient transport routes, particularly for freight, movement of freight, because that's never going to be moved any other way other than either in the back of a truck or a back of a, or on a train. And we're not going to move freight any other way. Um, and, and if you think for a future, if there were autonomous um, freight vehicles on motorways, we're not, whatever the toll system is for that, so you actually said it couldn't actually go onto a residential street. You must travel on the tollways. They're autonomous. They're electric vehicles we would find a much more efficient use of our existing road system and I might also add that part of that solution will be um, um, bicycles, so having bike lanes is a great solution, yeah, yeah. particularly, um, uh, thank you, um, particularly if in an environment where many of those could also be EV. So when you get to 60, get to 70, get to 80 even, you can still actually use, oh, yeah. uh, still use a bike. I thought you meant speed. Sorry? Yeah. I thought you meant speed limit. No, 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 no. no. That, was, uh, that was just me saying that um, technology can solve some of these solutions, but if all we think we can do is build more roads and have more cars, will that not be the solution? And, and Jeremy's right. The issue about building a city, that means you don't have to travel as much, but we still have to build transport corridors and freight corridors, and we've got to build them in a way that they easily translate to an autonomous environment where they are constrained to be on those tollways. Mm. That's the positive future, and there's long steps between now and then. If I can quote um, a Liberal Party representative from the election, um, it's going to get worse before it gets worse. Um, but we actually need to start thinking about what those solutions are and build the infrastructure to support that longer term solution. And I very much uh, support and um, I'm pleased that you're talking about a positive future because I think that that's sometimes lost in, in a lot of the conversations that we have, that there is a, a, you know, a very positive future for, for not only you know, Bexley but the state. Um, the other thing I've noticed is that um, a lot of what I've seen in the last couple of days on these issues, um, I, I'm, I live in Wagga and it makes me very pleased to be living in the region and so um, it, it seems to me that um, what you're, um, I guess, proposing in this is uh, more of a, a sort of satellite um, idea of Sydney where everything that you need is closer to where you live um, and if you do need to travel, there's those uh, interconnecting links to take you to the next satellite where you would need to go. Is that sort of a, um, I guess, you, a broader scale view of where you would see that um, progressing? Oh. I would love to share um, some ideas that George's River has developed about the future of, of Sydney, but if, even if you focus on the vision created by the Greater Sydney's, or the, as the Greater Cities Commission now, which is the notion that we all should be able to live within 
um, 30 minutes of all our needs by public transport. And those links are really strong. At the moment, those links aren't particularly strong if you're going north and south. It connects pretty well east-west, but some of the public transport links aren't particularly good north and south. But yes, but within that, there has to be a set of um, motorways, tollways, whatever they might be, that actually help that support freight and people movement as well. So it's not just one solution. There's multiple solutions. And yes, it is about creating places where people can work close to home or get there relatively quickly. So in that instance, and I guess I'm tying this all up into a nice bow now that we've managed to sort of um, uh, explore a couple of the, the options. The reason we're here today is because business owners in Bexley are struggling to find um, somewhere for their customers to park. They're struggling with the, the traffic and they, um, they feel as though some of the identity, I guess, of their, um, their area, their, their, their little CBD, has been lost to the clearways and the like. I think that would be a fair um, assessment of this morning's evidence if I was um, summarising it. So, in that instance, noting that the, the positive future that we are going to get to at some point, how do we now try and resolve some of the issues that we've got in the present day, noting that in the future we might be able to um, have those problems alleviated. Is there a structural uh, solution, i.e. more parking spaces around that CBD area? Is it um, the reduction in the size of the clearways and, and trying to funnel more people into to motorways? Is it a difference in the, um, perhaps, in the way that we toll? Um, I know, um, uh, Ms Witherley, you actually indicated at the start of, it, um, of your opening statement you had some sort of thoughts about that. We have the opportunity here now to hear from you know, two people that are actually involved in the planning um, of these, these areas but also um, have a lot of training in that broader picture. I'd love to know your thoughts about what we can do now but also keeping in mind that view of the future. I might just have a bit of a go at this and um, I'll then allow Jeremy to talk specifically about Bexley because he's the expert on Bexley but I'm happy to have a go at the future of Sydney because um, I do have a little bit of a background in that. So if I, if I was to say, you know, the, the problem of the Bexley businesses is not unique in Sydney. There are many strip um, shopping and main streets that are affected by simply through traffic. People are just passing by and they've been being given priority over people who want to do business in those areas or the people who already live in those areas. The, the Greater, Sydney's, the Greater Cities Commission, um, um, Tropolis of Three Cities, together with the Future Transport Strategy, started to address this issue. Some of the answers are already in those documents. The, there's a place and movement continuum which talks about the role of streets through to motorways, we are far too often down the end of turning all our roads into a means to go somewhere else or go past things. We actually need to start thinking about creating um, the roads as, as, as places as well. To do that, we need to get some of the traffic where we can off those roads onto those dedicated motorways. And having a tolling system that almost punishes people for using those, um, those, those roads and they're almost, you know, in their own um, thought process say it would be easier for me to, and cheaper for me to use local roads. That, that's a consequence of, of that. Um, and having better transport so people don't always need to, to actually get in their car and go places would also be helpful. So I would certainly encourage the committee to, to perhaps it's a question, might be a good question to ask the Greater Cities Commission. Mm. You know, what are some of the solutions to this? And some of their documents have actually started to, to, to look at that issue. Mm. Um, the North Connect solution is, of course, has been. It's $24 to use North Connect for tunnel. It's a nearly $200 fine if you don't. And I'm not suggesting that is necessarily the solution here. 
but it's a bit perverse that it costs you more to use the tollway and, so, and save the local streets than it is to use the local streets. And, and I think that is the challenge. So I mean, we've, got, hmm. we've got to find a way to turn that around where people see the value in a tollway. And, I, and a number of people will say to you, yeah, I don't use the tollways. It's not just the price. One accident and I'm held up. You know, it's not necessarily always an extra saving of the six minutes. It may very well be a delay of two hours. That's a risk on any road system. It, uh, it most certainly is. Or a train, you know, for that matter, you know, well, or light rail. And yeah. uh, Mr Mallard, I would also say that in the case of a tollway or a motorway, when it's three lanes fixed and you cannot get off it mm. once you're on it, mm. some people weigh that risk. It's never mm. particularly bothered me, you know, I'm, if I'm going to use a tollway, I accept I might get held up, but I also accept the advantage of it. I think, Ms Witherley, you and I agree on a lot of things. I mean, the nirvana of traffic management that you talk about, the utopia... Uh, I don't like the word utopia, <laughs> it suggests... <laughs> but uh, it's Something like, else. you know, I've been public office since 2000, and uh, the City of Sydney, and now moving further out, Parramatta, you're seeing the treatment of streets and roads as destinations in themselves. You know, that, that one of the sort of utopias we'd like to see is Parramatta Road, when the West Connex is finally done, being pacified in a sense, you know, try to reduce it. So what I'm getting at is, and that, that, that thinking and the resources that have to go with that are starting to move out into other areas, like I say Parramatta and elsewhere. So in here, and it goes a bit to what my colleague Mr Rath asked the previous people about in terms of their comment around congestion was actually, um, flying so fast was more an issue now, sometimes around here, to the nirvana here would be, and I guess that's more Mr Morgan's area, is um, ultimately to reduce the, 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 like to provide more parking, beautify the streets, get the trucks off the roads. Well, create good congestion. Hmm. People often think of congestion as only a bad thing, but sometimes yes. congestion where it's slower traffic, people coming into an area because they're visiting the area and they're wanting to do business in that area. Yeah. So. Yeah, the Mayor of Bogota uh, said congestion is our great friend when he came to yes, Sydney and gave us yes, a talk. Yes. Yeah. Um, can congestion when it's slowing down the delivery of, of uh, freight or whatever costs us, costs us if we're travelling somewhere else. But if it's actually to slow vehicles down and deliver a better place as a consequence, it's actually a very, can be a very positive thing. You know, a mad solution would, might be to remove the clearways. Just noting that Mr Tullock has uh, re-entered the building. It might be sorry. a good opportunity for oh, Mr my Morgan. One solution. Sure. So, Mr Morgan, to answer the question I had about um, mm. what might be able to be done around the Bexley CBD area. Sure. So I guess in opening response to that question, I've not worked with a, a Chamber of Commerce anywhere across um, a number of local governments who haven't wanted extra parking. Um, so that's obviously one of the things that's in high demand for, for most local businesses. Um, parking is one part of the, the issue, but um, a comment from Mr Mallard about pacifying um, Parramatta Road, mm. that's really what we need to see through Bexley. The, just to give you some idea of metrics, um, Harrow Road, which is just down the road from the Bexley um, local strip, in the section that the council is responsible for, in a five to six year period, sorry, the number of heavy vehicles on that section has gone from 610 per day to 2,695. So over 2,000 extra trucks in that section in a six year period. 300% increase. So those trucks are also predominantly coming through Bexley Road, through Forest Road. I'll just Road. get you to repeat those figures. Sure. Just so, we can... so in 2015, Yeah. We had 610 heavy vehicles a day. Yeah. In 2021, we had 2,695 on the same stretch. Yeah. Thank you. So per day. Per day. Um, so those vehicles are coming through these local areas. So whilst parking is definitely an issue, um, council has taken some action to try and increase the number of parking spaces spaces through Bexley Town Centre. Um, we've demolished a, a former community centre and library to provide additional parking. 
um, modified some other parking spaces to increase the numbers, um, put time restrictions to generate turnover in some of the other off-street parking. So we've taken a number of initiatives to try and improve parking in Bexley. And on-street parking is convenient for, for visitors, we know that. So having greater access to the on-street parking immediately in front of businesses will help. But it's the impacts on the local amenity in the centre that's probably the, the biggest issue. It's unpleasant. There's so many trucks coming through at a constant rate. Um, it's not somewhere that's pleasant to sit down and have a coffee when you've got trucks rumbling past two metres away from where you're sitting, mm. a metre and a half away from where you're sitting. Uh, the noise, the vibration, it's unpleasant. So even for our local residents who don't need the parking directly in front of the shops, who would walk there, it's not pleasant for them to do it. Mm. So yes, I agree, parking is an issue that we would like to see um, addressed with the clearways, but it's, it's those traffic volumes that really are the, the biggest limiting impact or limiting factor. Are those truck number increases, are they related to, for example, the construction of uh, the M8 or the um, uh, West Connects? Is that um, part of what has seen that, as I said, about a th it's over 300%, my quick, you know, back of the, back of the napkin figures. Um, in six years, that seems like a, an awful lot. Where is the source of that coming from? Is it also, you know, botany and the like, or is it is it a localised issue, i.e. the M8 that's actually, you know, will be, once it's completed, we'll see a reduction in that number of, of trucks? So that, that's a good question. That's, it's one specific example that, we've, that I've used because it's such a dramatic increase. There's no obvious connection from when council officers looked at the traffic generation. There's no obvious connection with, with M8 Traffic Works. It's not the route that they choose on their um, traffic management plans. It's not part of their route. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the reason for that increase, um, we don't have a, a specific answer. Um, you know, we are certainly drawing a conclusion at some point that there is some association with the tolls on the M5 East. Um, we have just seen uh, significant increases in heavy vehicles right through the network. Thank you. All right, Mr Mello. I just wanted to uh, tease out a bit more of the volume increase in traffic that you reported. First of all, Council would have a record of studies, this Council, previous Councils. Um, I, I, I guess there's been some natural truck growth in the truck uh, since 15 to now because of the warehousing has just exploded in South West Sydney. Um, so there'll be a little bit of it. Uh, are you, have you got any research on destinations? Like we're watching the container trucks here today. Uh, you said before, you made a reference to local transport hubs. Do you, have you tracked, uh, done a sampling of tracking where these trucks are going that we're seeing go through here? Or container no, we, trucks? We haven't done the origin destination on those, on those movements. Um, this specific example was in response to concerns from residents about the number of trucks they've witnessed going past. Um, we were very surprised when we saw the results. Mm. Uh, we were expecting an increase, but certainly not to that, that number. Um, their origins, it's not all container trucks. No. So container trucks are part of um, the increase in volumes, but it's also the, the truck and dogs of the construction trucks that uh, mm. transporting spoil. Um, we're seeing um, the Pantex, which are delivering to supermarkets and the like. So it's quite a mix of different trucks. It's, it's not all contained trucks. But like those, I'd be interested to know, like those Pantex, are they delivering to local supermarkets or are they going through to the distribution warehouses in South West Sydney? There wouldn't be a need for the, such an increase in volume in, in local supermarkets. There hasn't been that scale of development in the area. No. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question about what the origin destination is, but mm. we just don't have that information. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I might just finally put to you, uh, and you've addressed some of this in your evidence, but I might just put to you one view that's been put to us by the uh, freight companies, large and small, that has contributed to the issue here on the M5 corridor, and just see if you'd like to respond to it. Really, they've put the view to the committee in evidence previously 
that the price that's been struck here for the tolls on this corridor is wrong. That's one of the things that has really put these trucks uh, onto suburban streets rather than in the tollways where they were promised. Um, you've ranged freely in your contributions about what some solutions might be here, but I was just interested in you responding to that very specific evidence from the freight companies that we've had. So I might ask first Ms Wedley, then Mr Morgan, uh, would you like to comment on that specific um, I suppose the question I would ask the freight companies, what would the price have to be for them to be on the motorway? And I think, I think that, that is the answer. I mean, everyone would say, everyone wants to pay less, but is legitimately them paying less mean they will be on it or not? I mean, I'd ask them the question. It does, the tolls in, on roads vary so much. Um, we don't, you know, and that goes back to that issue about, you know, the equity of different tolls and it really is that the fair way to, to collect the funds for cons to fund either construction or, on, or future infrastructure. Um, Jeremy might have a far better sense of the mm. tolls in this area Thank and the you. impact. Yeah. I've certainly seen a lot of um, media articles, um, I've seen interviews on TV from, um, from business operators talking about the cost of the tolls and the, the impact on their business. Uh, I've spoken to friends who operate businesses in the local community and the cost increase for them. Um, it certainly is, seems to be one of the hot topics, is the, the actual price point mm. of using the toll. Uh, in terms of whether, there was a question earlier about whether the, um, oh, the benefit return, the, you get a benefit on return for that, that outlay. Mm. That's hard to, to know without seeing the the overall cost for that business, but someone will be paying that price. Um, and if the transport operators can't pass it on to their clients, it's hitting their, their bottom line. So mm -hmm. at some point there will be, there's price elasticity, elasticity in a lot of things in society and the tolls, I guess is one of them. But certainly from what I've heard um, over the last couple of years is that the toll is too high. Mm. One of the suggestions that's been made so that people can make that decision is to have signage at the entryway to Who toll roads that, that indicates uh, perhaps how much time you might save oh, the and the cost of the tolls. Is that the sort of thing that might assist as people are making those decisions? Yeah, in, in terms of the time savings, it needs to translate into a real dollar um, benefit to that business. So the saving of 10 minutes per trip, if they can't get that $22, I think it was $22 in return for that 10 minutes, mm. they're still not going to take that option. Mm. So it, understanding what the um, benefit is to those businesses, I think for some business operators, trying to articulate what that real cost benefit to them is might be difficult. So having access to that information, I certainly think would help. There, um, there are, you know, I know I've, I came out with, you know, a utopia, sorry, um, this notion that, you know, road pricing can be approached in lots of different ways, but actually one of the ways it can be approached is to adjust the price based on usage. And um, there's a parking system that's used in, I think it's San Francisco anyway, it always sets the price for parking in a particular location so that there's always, within that block, there's always a few spaces available. So if it's a really popular area, they keep putting the price up until they get to that stage of the price price point, the elasticity where people say, oh, I'm gonna, I'll park a bit further away which, where it's slightly cheaper. You know, a slightly mad, because well, I'm not, not, mad. Not, not very equitable, I would suggest. Um, you, you were it, talking about equity is, before. Yes, <laughs> yep, okay. But a, perhaps there is Canisian. an opportunity, <laughs> Mr Mallow, to think that we need to do something to test what the toll needs to be to make sure more people use it. If more people use it, then perhaps the return is the same than leaving it as it is. If that's the aim, is to get those trucks onto the tollway. We need to have a price signal that that's what they should do. And you can move the, the toll. We talk, 
because one of the terms of reference, I did go back and have double checked the terms of reference, was to look about how the price of the tolls are set. And at the moment, we set it based on an expected number of trips and therefore a return. When that's not being met, the return's not being generated because it's a commercial decision about that. But if it's not being, if there's not enough people using the toll way, I'm not sure why the price isn't being adjusted to meet, to actually encourage more people to use it. So that the, the saving of 10 minutes, it's only costing us $5, not $22. I think someone has, you, you, you've got to be looking at a lot of solutions and one of them is that price needs to be prepared to be adjusted based on the usage of of the, the, the toll well, way. With technology, it's not like you have to put the money in your pocket and stick it in the little bucket. You yeah. mean, it's, it's an automatic thing. It just uh, beep beeps. still hurts. Yeah. I, I, made, I made the observation to the earlier witnesses that uh, it, the, you're talking about, I mean, it's a minor, very small minority of certainly trucks, because we can pick them out, that are avoiding the toll that are coming through here. I mean, if you get, I, I live in the Blue Mountains, I use the M5 a lot. Um, it's chock a block full of semi-trailers and trucks. So I'm just making the observation that you know, the, the pricing seems to be right for the vast majority. It's this minority that are, that are diverting around. And then, then the solution would be to price the local roads for those Yeah, those well that trucks. might where we come which back is, to the North is, Connects. Which is the North Connects so, yes. solution. And they, as a resident of those northern suburbs, I live in Hornsby, and I used to travel that trip every day to, when I worked at Parramatta. I can tell you, when, now when I go there, there are no trucks. You'd have to have a look then at the knock-on effect to other parallel major roads, whether they exactly just go right. further around. Exactly right. still have to look yeah. at that. That's why I think the complexity yeah, is with this is, one. Yeah. North Connects is pretty simple Possibly. in regards to one road. I, we hmm. have technology I think could solve that hmm. issue hmm. Um, in terms of where trucks are travelling. You should come work for Transport New South Wales. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your evidence. Uh, unless there's any other um, questions from committee members, we might... Um, conclude there. I want to thank you though for the evidence you've given us. It's certainly been very helpful I think. You may have taken one question on notice uh, and we'll ask that that's returned within 21 days. The Secretary will contact you in relation to the question you've taken on notice. Uh, thank you for that. We'll take a short break now until 1pm uh, when the committee will resume. I'll now uh, welcome, I'll just welcome our witnesses to the um, resumption of the hearing. Uh, we will shortly ask each witness to state their name and position title and swear an oath or affirmation. I might start here on my left and then we'll work across. So uh, I'll invite you to uh, uh, no, My to name is uh, Badgett Mr. Barn. Cullen. I'm a local resident and vice president of North Bexley Public School, PNC. Thank you. And would you like to take the oath or the affirmation? Thank you. Um, I'll take an affirmation. Solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. I'll just remind the witnesses to pull the microphone to them, uh, just particularly given the audio in the hall. Um, uh, I'll now ask our next witness to uh, uh, give the oath or the affirmation. Thank you. I'm Yasmina Kovacevic, and I'll give an affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. My name's Osman Karolja. I'm the principal of one of the local schools. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. My name is Eugene McFarlane. I uh, am a resident in the local area, uh, a chemical engineer by background. Uh, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Uh, my name's Les Trompe, I'm a local resident. Um, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me should be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Uh, so help me God. Great, thank you. I'm Daniel Eggman. I'm a local resident and have a student in a, in a local public school. I solemnly, I give an affirmation, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now 
about to be given uh, by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Right, thank you for that. What we'll do now is just ask each of you, you'll have the opportunity to make a short statement. Uh, I'll ask you to keep it reasonably brief, just to a minute or two minutes. We'll go again from left to right. Feel free to tell us exactly where you're coming from, then we'll move to um, questions from the committee. So, Mr. Khan, I might start with you and just invite you to make a short opening statement. Right. Um, I have written everything down so I don't forget anything. So. Good. <laughs> Sorry for reading off a piece of paper. Um, look, I'm a local resident, a pedestrian, a cyclist, and vice president of Festival Public School, as I mentioned earlier. I'm a father of two little girls li living and working from my family home on Stony Creek Road intersection at Medway Street. Today I'm before you in these capacities as a parent and community representative carrying the voice of the local school. Um, I also have a short video that I'll <coughs> present later on, I suppose, sure. um, if you have an opportunity. Um, okay, um, I'm, here, I'm going to express the negative impact of toll increases on the traffic conditions, including pollution, dangerous driving, and the risk posed to all members of the community by trucks and trailers running through an, an otherwise progressive residential area. The damage to the surrounding buildings, infrastructure, community, local businesses, and standard of living is evident to anyone visiting the area. Almost every week, increasingly our streets face accidents and near misses, and that have become so commonplace. Heavy goods vehicles and cars speed through our streets with complete disregard to the impact caused in this community. All right, thank you for that statement. Thank you, Chair. So I'll try and not read off my notes. Um, I'm Yasmina, I'm a local resident and I also am the partial owner, partially the bank, um, of a commercial building. Um, and the objective I have today is to talk to you about um, the impacts this is having on my local community. Um, and the local community um, includes residents, it includes retail tenants, it includes um, single people trying to rent in the area um, in shop top housing, which is no longer suitable due to the intense noise pollution um, and chaos. Um, caused by ongoing congestion. I've also prepared um, some, uh, I guess, a document that I wish to submit um, for the committee, but I would like to make some recommendations as part of my submission. And the recommendations recognise that we're not experts in this area because it's, it's this whole um, issue of you know, should we fix one problem at the expense of another group? And it's a difficult and complex question. Um, I don't profess to be an expert. I certainly don't, I hope I don't get asked questions about the toll regimes because that's not my um, area of expertise. But what I have witnessed firsthand, as have my tenants, both the retail tenant that has recently given notice and my residential tenant, which I have great difficulty in keeping um, for, for longer terms um, is that we need a solution and we need it fast. We, we need the solution yesterday, really. Um, so that's really what my submission is about. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, being the school leader, I'm here not just on behalf of the staff and students, but also their parents and local residents around our school, our neighbours, we've got a wonderful rapport with the impact has been more than just uh, a trickle of new traffic. It's been a significant increase in new traffic and particularly heavy vehicles, as can be seen by anyone who travels along Marsh Street um, over at Arncliffe Mascot and see the huge lines of trucks uh, who are moving off the Eastern Distributor to get onto Stony Creek Road or Forest Road. The impact it has beyond just uh, added noise, and the added noise is a real concern for not just residents but schools who face onto Stony Creek Road. Uh, it's unrelenting and it goes on all day, well after school hours. We're also concerned that traffic, the increased traffic, particularly of heavy vehicles, has not just caused backlog in local areas, but often it's uh, cars travelling at speed. Um, in what was once a reasonably quiet suburban area, even with Stony Creek Road on our doorstep. 
We now have got parents almost playing the game of roulette as they try to get access outside of the school. That's due to heavy vehicles coming on. Um, and unfortunately, you always get the fee that there's an accident, a significant accident waiting to happen. We're also concerned at the impact of costs and the cost of living. We've got a large catchment of parents who come from different parts of Sydney and staff. Um, some of our staff come over from Mascot East Lakes. Uh, there's now an increase in their cost to come into work every day. We've got former students who are students at the University of New South Wales and other colleges in the eastern suburbs who've had a significant increase in their cost in their commute to university, college or their employment. We've got el elderly residents who have medical appointments at often the eastern suburbs and this is a significant cause of stress for them. So the impact is at many levels and it's something which we hope will be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to thank you and the committee for allowing me to provide evidence today on the subject of errors and overcharging in the calculation of the Sydney M5 East toll road. Um, I've lived in Sydney for over 50 years and for over half of that time, I've commuted from uh, around Roselands, Beverly Hills to Botany. Um, I've estimated the, the continuing direct cost of the East uh, M5 East toll on me personally to be about three and a half thousand dollars per year. Um, but today, um, I'm not here to talk about that. What I'd like to do is present the facts outlining the overcharging of the M5 East tolls by WestConnex Transurban based on their own tolling formula. Uh, typically, and WestConnex is no different, uh, toll charges are calculated based on a flag fall and a price per kilometre. So using WestConnex's own tolling formula and the distance from King George's Road to Marsh Street through the tunnel on the M5 East, we get a number that is $2 less than the actual amount that is charged by WestConnex. It's a, a little bit different if you enter at Kingsgrove Road, but the, the number is still about $2 in excess of what you would get using their toll formula. Uh, I've got evidence that uh, shows that they've been quoting the, the formula since mid-2020 when they started the tolling process and that this, uh, this overcharging has continued uh, since then. Uh, in, in summary, um, or as recommendations, what I would hope uh, is that uh, this committee looks at this overcharging and that the inquiry make relevant recommendations that WestConnex compensates those customers for this uh, discrepancy and uh, acknowledging the error in the calculation uh, that the tolls be changed so that they reflect the existing toll formula at least and this would reduce the cost to people using the M5 East t t uh, tunnel from King George's Road by two dollars per trip. And I'd like to seek leave to tender this document in support of the evidence I've provided. Great. So Thank if you, you will um, get you to hand that up through the committee staff okay. uh, and table that now. Thank you for that. Uh, my name's Les Crompton. I'm a, a lifetime resident of Bexley. Uh, I went to school in the 50s and 60s. I've seen all the changes before there were traffic lights, before there were pedestrian crossings, believe it or not. So we go back a while. I'm a former councillor on uh, Rockdale Council and I've represented the state members of COGRA on the traffic committee at First Rockdale Council and Bayside Council for the last 20 years. So I've got a bit of an idea of what's going on. Uh, I suppose cutting it short without taking too much of your time. Uh, I recall when the M5 East opened. It was a Sunday prior to Christmas. Um, Carl Scully came out with uh, Cherie Burton. We got our crossing in the middle of, this, uh, uh, middle of Bexley, virtually, between, um, shall we say, Kingsland Road and Bexley Road. Carl Scully walked out in the road and said, well, there's no traffic. The traffic had gone. That was 20 odd years ago. Uh, the current government have virtually turned back time. They've brought it all back. Uh, and that's the concern I have. Uh, I had a business in Bexley for some 12 years. That's not a problem for me, but you know, we've had the odd car run into the building. Uh, as they race through. Uh, also, as well as impacting us with bringing all the traffic back, uh, they put the clearways in, both sides. Not one side, but both. There was always one side. 
in the AM and one side in the PM. They brought it back. So as a resident, that took amenities off a lot of our residents. And uh, when you look at our shopping centre per se, they took, the they took the parking away, which was provided by the previous government. They put more parking in. It was good. We started a community bank because we are a close community. But I'd say the government at the moment are trying to divide our community and or whatever reason. But uh, that's another story. The worst part as well, I think when you've got a lot of people that work at the airport, a lot of those are hand-to-mouth people. They work four-hour shifts. They can't afford the toll, so they're coming through Bex and I can't blame them. A lot of owner drivers come through Bexley with their trucks because they can't pay $25 to go through to Port Botany and the residents can't afford to pay $7.31 to drive through to go to work. So that's why we've got it back on our roads and that's just a problem that our current government has created. Uh, maybe a way of resolving that slightly is to drop the toll by two thirds, topping Bexley School in arithmetic once. If you look at the traffic, if you put it back and it's only two thirds or it's one third of what it is now, they would make their money. But no one's doing any counting because the gov current government sold off a road that was free. It was given to the people of New South Wales. And the worst thing was it was too successful. And look at the growth, as was mentioned earlier, out in the west. The grandkids live out at Leppington. The amount that's gone on there in the last eight years is phenomenal all of that area, and it's going to keep coming. Now, why the government sold it off a free road that belonged to the people, I'm not sure, but uh, I'll park it there for now, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also have my notes. Um, so my name is Daniel, and I'm living uh, between Hurstville and Kingsgrove with my family. It used to be a quiet neighborhood. Our daughter studies at Kingsgrove High School, what used to be a safe and, and um, healthy learning environment. But this has all dramatically changed about two years ago when the, government, the Perete government, on behalf of Transurban, imposed a new toll on the old M5 East Tunnel. This, is, this new and ever-increasing tax is toll mainly on steroids. The, the Perete government, as the puppets of Transurban, are cost-of-living villains. They cause a massive health and, and safety crisis because the new toll is not value for money, becomes more and more unaffordable with every double inflation increase and redirect, redirects most traffic from the tunnel to suburban streets like here, you see it out here in Bexley. Fact is that the restaurant traffic along Stony Creek and Forest Road has more than doubled. Trucks have increased tenfold. Noise pollution is on harmful levels. And road accidents, booming, speeding and dangerous driving have drastically escalated. I really appreciate that you're coming here today and listening to the suffering communities becoming victims of these mistakes and inaction of the Perete government and the greed of Transurban. It is remarkable that within, it's the first time in two years of this crisis that somebody is listening to suffering communities. And I would like to take the opportunity here again to encourage Dominic Perete, Natalie Ward, Transport for New South Wales and Transurban to follow suit and start listening to people, appreciate the unacceptable situation firsthand, admit their mistakes instead of blaming others, and resolve the crisis that they have caused. If last weekend's election result wasn't proof enough that people are fed, fed up with the liberal arrogance and ignorance of people, what is? People are, are disgruntled about politics paid by big corporate like Transurban who bribes for crook deals and ignore people's health and safety in return. The systematic uh, discrimination of southwestern Sydney by Dominic Perrette is a disgrace and must stop. Already this year there were multiple horrible accidents along Stony Creek Road, some right in front of uh, Kingsgrove High School where my daughter has to endure not only harmful noise levels every day but also more and more dangerous roads. There was also a pedestrian that was um, hit by a, by a truck recently in, in, in Bexley. It's not the fault of the pedestrian or the truck, it's the fault of these uh, deals of the government with Patron's Urban not respecting the health and safety of people affected. But the Premier, Natalie Ward, Andrew Constance, Rob Stokes, Transport for New South Wales and Transurban are hypocrites if they claim they're, they're concerned about road safety. They are not. They choose to ignore obvious health and safety concerns. They refuse to experience the devastation firsthand. And they don't accept accountability. And they're unwilling to resolve the crisis that they have caused. 
I also quickly would like to uh, make a, some comments about the submissions to this commission and, and how Transurban and Transport for New South Wales was very softly treated so far. I looked at some of the submissions and the hearings and Transurban and Traffic for New South Wales, they just copy paste from each other and uh, I'm really shocked about this honesty, the deception of, of those reports. They're claiming it's safer now on M5 East. This is grossly dishonest because it's not safer if you look on the entirety of the road network of Sydney. The accidents have increased drastically. Just last week, a, a boy in front of High, Kingsgrove High School was hit by a truck. This is caused by Transurban. This is caused by tra Transport for New South Wales that has become a political organization that just um, tries to cover up and it tries to hide the inconvenient truths. I think there is a lot of um, solutions that have been proposed. Um, I also have, have some, some pro uh, proposals on that. It really needs to look looked at. And I think one of the major problem here is that Transurban keeps on paying big party donations and gets this kind of, of contracts in, in return. They are the cost of living villains. They are not willing to be responsible and ethically and have a moral business um, that is sustain, sustainable for, for people. So I really would encourage Transurban to look in that their mirror and tell us if they're comfortable that they're making their fortunes and their um, there are big bonuses on the back of the most vulnerable, like students that are suffering in, 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 in classrooms under harmful noise levels. Right, thank you for those opening statements. I might ask those people who've um, given written statements, if they were able to hand those up, that's one of the things that's useful for um, Hansard, just in recording the, uh, and for the committee secretary in recording what's happened today. So if people are happy to hand those up, that would be uh, very useful. I might um, turn in uh, opening the questions just to that school question first about the impact on uh, staff. Um, we've had reports in other places about uh, this potentially meaning people choose to work elsewhere, that um, the cost of tolls impacts on whether or not it is viable for people to continue working in the place they have. Uh, is it at the moment at that level when it comes to the impact on school staff, or is it really just still stretching the budget? It's very much at that level, uh, Chair, for school staff who've got families and who've got added responsibilities and other um, uh, circumstances. It would be different for some of our staff who don't have those responsibilities, but I can certainly confirm for some of our staff members who've got young families, who've got those other costs and living stresses and pressures which all of us uh, have to endure, that this added um, cost to work and away from work is uh, beyond what they can bear. And as a result, they now themselves um, try to move away from using the toll road uh, to save on those costs and are largely now actually uh, have the added pressure of not just being late or under stress because of the significant increase in traffic uh, from Marsh, the Marsh Road exit, uh, through Forest and Stony Creek Road into Kings Road. So we're definitely at that breaking point for many individuals. All right, thank you for that. And Mr Crompton, you've described this as almost turning back time. How is it that uh, the government spent more than $4 billion on a new tunnel, but it's meant that we're back to having trucks on these roads? Well, How originally the... Uh, oh, sorry. Originally, the tunnel was to take the traffic, the, uh, should we say, outside traffic off our local roads and put it into the M5 tunnel. And it, it worked. That's exactly what happened. Uh, when I say turning back time, uh, we've got the traffic back because you, you can understand why they're not going to pay the toll. Why should they when they can come on our suburban streets? But it would appear as though they've turned their back on our community by doing that. Uh, and if you do your sums, which, you know, it's pretty simple, if they reduce it by two thirds, people probably could afford to use it, but they're not, and that's the problem. We've gone back, if we go back to uh, prior to the M5, uh, in the evening the traffic was back to Walleye Creek Road, which is halfway to Arncliffe. Uh, in the morning it was beyond Preddy's Road and beyond the golf course. That was just the way it was. Once the M5 tunnel opened, that traffic was gone. 
That's why Carl Scully was able to walk out in the middle of Forest Road stand and look, there's no traffic. Mm. And that was as soon as it opened. Uh, that was the Friday after it opened, I'm sorry. It opened on a Sunday, mm. Mm. Friday Christmas uh, 2001. And uh, just one question to all of you. The councils have turned up today and given evidence to the inquiry that they'd be open to providing feedback uh, into the transport processes and they believe that the community should have the opportunity to uh, have direct input. Uh, I'll just put it to you that, um, oh, well, I'll ask you firstly, have you had the opportunity? Do you feel you've had the opportunity to have a say directly into these questions? And would you be open to having one if you were given that chance? We did have a working group, and I may not call it the right thing. Um, it was related to the transport issues, and um, that is no longer uh, functioning, and I believe it's because of the council elections. Um, but I feel that in terms of our local council, we can have our voices heard. I think a lot of the issues we're talking about here are at state government level, and this is the frustration we're experiencing um, it is called a state road, and I'm talking particularly about Forest Road in this example, yet what does that mean? Does that mean it can become a highway through residential areas and through areas where there are school children? We have many, many schools on this strip of road along Forest Road, going from Bexley down to Arncliffe, and it is just not tenable to, to treat that as a highway in effect, an extension of the motorway, as Les said, um, without the toll. Mm. So the toll avoidance behaviour, this is something that we are really interested in having the state government, New South Wales Transport, um, evaluate with a view to coming up with real solutions for our community. Mm. There is toll avoidance behaviour going on. I'm speaking apolitically when I say that because I'm not interested in blaming one side at the expense of the other, but it should not be that our community is expected to endure it when you look at other parts of Sydney that are not expected to do the same. And I'm using the example of Lane Cove Tunnel. Mm. No, thank you. Uh, and Mr. finally, Mr. Farlow, I might just ask you to talk to your, um, just a little bit more to your observation about the uh, formula, in fact, making the case that for one part of Sydney, for one toll road in particular, uh, drivers are being charged more. You say it's uh, $2 a trip, of course that adds up over time, that could be $1,000 a year uh, when it comes to a regular commuter making the trip. Um, can you give us uh, any more detail about this discrepancy that you're drawing attention to? Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, in the document I tabled, there is a, a simple table, and in it shows the cost of the toll on the M4 motorway. It's, a, I think, about 7.5 kilometres, and the cost on that toll road for that distance is um, about $5 something, in other words, $2 less than the M5 East Tunnel. So the, the only question you have to ask yourself is, Am I right about the 7.2 kilometre length of the M5 East from King George's Road to uh, Marsh Street, which is the other end of the toll booth? That's easy to check. Um, I did it myself. I drive there every day. It's about 7.2 kilometres. So why the discrepancy? Why is there a $2 difference when West Connects itself talks about its formula and uses that, it says, to calculate those toll charges? Um, I, I think the question could be asked about why it's like that. Um, well, just before I go on, you'll notice in that table, for some reason, I put a question mark in the table. There's a, there's, they don't quote that kilometre distance between King George's Road and Marsh Street. Why not? Um, I, I think, uh, well, speculate, I'd be speculating, but if someone did to write that number down, it would be obvious there was a discrepancy. Oh, no, I was just um, looking at your um, figures quite uh, diligently because um, I, I do find it quite fascinating. But um, I do wonder if the M5 East component, given that it can be um, uh, it's effectively a, sh a smaller distance based tolling regime, that perhaps it's because of the, where you join it and where you exit 
varies on that route, whereas some of the other ones it does not. It's just a single toll is perhaps yeah. the answer to that. Um, that is so I'd, I'd like to address that, by the way, because yeah. it's easy. It's, if you're travelling west on the M5 East, you go through the, the General Homes Drive Tunnel, yep. and you before you get, and, and you can imagine that could be told, but it's not, there's an opportunity to leave the road at Marsh Street, Street before you get onto the toll road. That's yep. where the toll booth is. Correct. So how else do you charge tolls other than by the toll, uh, tolling booths? And, and I could understand an alternative measure, but I'm, I'm quoting the West Connects methodology when I quote this. Mm. So, I, don't, I, I find mm. it fascinating, and I'm going to go through it with more detail right. when I get home yeah, and sure. have the opportunity to... Um, no, no, I, I understand. It's, it's there to be looked at yourself. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, look, thank you very much for, uh, for coming and appearing today and uh, you know, providing the insights to, to the committee. Um, we've had the opportunity so far today to, to hear um, from business owners and to hear from the councils um, that uh, I guess have carriage of uh, the issues here and now it's a chance to hear from, from residents. Um, I guess um, the issues that we've heard um, vary and this is um, part of the problem around uh, trying to find a solution, I guess, is that um, uh, for some people it's, it's, it's an issue of traffic, for some people it's an issue of parking, for some people it's an issue of uh, noise. Uh, and uh, for others who aren't residents of this area, um, there's the issue of um, the cost of living. So I guess um, as I look around the room, um, what do you see as the solution? Um, and I know it's, it, we've talked about the, the tolls themselves, but what, um, what do you see as a practical solution at the moment to actually resolve some of the concerns that you've raised? And uh, um, I, I'll allow you to provide a response. Sorry, no, I can't pronounce Thank your surname. You. It's, it's Ms. <laughs> Kovacevic. Thank you. So firstly, I, I would state that I don't agree with your um, assumption that we have varied issues. I think it's quite the opposite. Okay. I think the issue is unanimously the same issue, and that is the toll regime for the M5 East is flawed. It is having massive unintended, possibly unintended consequences on its community on the business community, residents, schools, businesses, the lot. The impacts are being felt differently by um, all of us, and that's something you're hearing today, and that's through the stories we're telling you, the facts that we're presenting. But the issue, I, I will repeat, is the same issue. In terms of some solutions, in my submission, I've got three, um, I guess, quite general recommendations I wasn't sure if we were able to bring recommendations to you. Go ahead. So I'm just going to read them out quickly. The first one is that the government and its responsible portfolios reverse the imposed clearways along Stony Creek Road, Forest Road, Bexley. I've added Stony Creek Road, business district and satellite business districts between Walleye Creek Road and Queen Victoria Street. This particular mention relates to my immediate community. This has created a direct incentive for further tollway avoidance behaviour. And this is something we witnessed, where a department knowingly established clearways that were to the detriment of the local communities and local businesses. And we know that the government is interested in supporting small business. So I think that is one recommendation, that they conduct an independent study into this impact um, and hopefully they can reverse these clearways. The second one is a study into the equity of approach to toll avoidance prevention strategies. And by that I mean whatever is in place in Lane Cove, around the Lane Cove Tunnel, and I don't know it in detail. What I do know is that the same toll avoidance behaviour is not happening there. So what is it that we about our community that is different? Is it that we're undeserving or less deserving? So the second recommendation is that there's an independent study into the equity, equity of approach to toll avoidance prevention strategies across Sydney and its toll regimes. And the third one relates to 
uh, again, it's a concept around whether there's a better way to calculate the full length or the greatest distance covered from the southwest um, to avoid so many exits at Bexley Road. And there are so many people, trucks, small trucks, large trucks, semi-trailers, small cars, exiting at Bexley Road to avoid further toll payments. So that's can, can I, a wrap up. Can I say that th th those are actually um, some very uh, interesting mm. concepts and, and um, look, you know, I think it's, it's, it's um, admirable that uh, you brought them here. It's, it's really a shame that the, the opposition leader didn't stick around to actually hear those in person instead of doing the stunt and then leaving. However, we're here now, and so we'll be able yeah, to, I guess, put those... You're at risk of being called Well, we, well I just making, I'm just making the observation, Chair, that, uh, you know, he made a stunt and then he's departed and not actually stayed here from the inquiry. Yeah, but um, I guess um, in relation to the clearway issue that you raised initially as your first answer, what we heard from um, some of the residents was... Uh, sorry, um, from the, from the um, business owners was that... Um, there was initially a clearway, I think, on um, uh, what they call a, a, a one-way clearway. So in the mornings, um, one side was a, cl a clearway, and then on the afternoon, the opposite side was a clearway. Um, if we were to reverse, like, to go back to that regime of clearways, um, or um, if I'm reading you correctly, to abolish clearways altogether, is that to enable more parking? Is that what you would prefer, or, or the, the old regime of clearways? I don't think there's an easy answer to this. I think it needs to be properly evaluated and I guess some options analysis paper yep. uh, with some real solutions for the community. But obviously we, we're not expecting a perfect world. We're not that sort of community. Yep. We expect it to, to be a you know, decent amount of hustle and bustle, I guess yep. is what I'd call it. Um, but it is just impossible to get from A to B at the moment yep. and those clear ways are in place in, in more cases than not. Um, I'd have to take that question on notice because I'm not an expert on the clearway hours. Yeah. No, the, the reason I was asking was because um, in the instance, say, that we abolish clearways altogether, um, can you see a possibility that what would happen is that the Bexley area, the CBD, would be choked to actual local traffic even? That you'd actually be constricting the local traffic. My recommendation relates to the recently imposed extension of the clearways, okay. not clearways in an absolute form. Okay. Um, so that's, I guess, one of, the, um, one of the ideas that we've got to actually free up the area. Um, in relation to um, the tolling um, regime that's in place at the moment that you say is, a, a, I guess, a um, discouragement to people operating their vehicles, whether they be transport vehicles or personal vehicles, into the, the tunnel. Um, do you see if we were to, say, reduce the, um, the cost of the tolls or, or change the methodology around the way that we impose the tolls, that you would see a reduction in the um, surface movements um, around the Bexley area. Is that, is that I guess, the, okay. the view that you have? <coughs> Sorry, well, um, two Crump. things. First of all, uh, as pointed out by Eugene here, it's 7.2 k's from King George's Road through, and I believe the toll is uh, $7.21 or 31 which means it's a dollar per kilometre or part thereof. I think that's a little excessive to start with, which I suggested earlier. If you look at it on a serious note, uh, as um, Yasmina mentioned, um, we have a situation with clearways both ways. Now, let's turn back time again. Prior to the toll on the M5 East, there was in the uh, PM a um, clearway on the eastern side heading west. And of course, in the AM, on the western side here in the east. Uh, as well as doing that for, and, and as a, I speak as a resident, I'm also president of Bexley RSL, which is a business in the area, but sticking to residents, a lot of residents are, are disenchanted because 
when they put these clearways in, they also, as you've probably heard from the Chamber, or I think from Jeff, they took 20 odd parking spots away. Now why they did that, I don't know. If you've got one car or 20 cars, what's the difference? That's probably two things. It's ruining our CBD and the businesses in our CBD, and also making it very hard for residents. We've got a lot of elderly residents that might, might want to drive up and park and shop. It's, they don't have to drive down to Cogra or Rockdale or Hurstville. They can drive locally, keep their independence. That's gone. When the, when the parking goes, that goes as well. So that disadvantages another, lot, another section of residents that like to keep their independence and stay in their home and not go to a retirement village or a nursing home or whatever it is. Well, that also takes that from them, their, their freedom, uh, which also impacts on the businesses. So therefore, one, I believe the toll is too much and excessive in the fact that it's almost a dollar a kilometre, if you like. Uh, I don't know that that's the case anywhere else. But, but as, as well as that, um, we, if we were to drop that by two thirds, because most of the people coming through Bexley now are from the southwest, uh, and they do come to work at the airport and other such places, and they can't afford because a lot of them might be doing four hours at the airport. And um, as Qantas have got rid of all their permanent staff, and a lot of these people, uh, a lot of them, English is their first language, but they come to our country and they're flogged, or they've got to use our roads, they've got to be part of our, or our connect because of the disconnect, because of the toll. Now, those people that do work at the airport, and there's some 5,000 odd, I think it's built back up now with all the aircraft flying again. Uh, I suppose it was ideal when it first came on because uh, we had the pandemic, uh, the airport was closed, wasn't a big impact. But since then, it's built up and up, as Jasmine said, and it's ruining not only the business owners, but the facility for residents, to, or the ability for residents to go and park. Why they took the parking away, it makes no sense at all. And that's out of toll area, uh, out of um, clearway areas. Why did they do that? Was that a square up or they thought it was a good idea? If you park one car or 20 cars, it makes no difference, but it does make a difference to the, uh, the commercial centre of Bexley. When you say square up, what do you mean by that? Uh, okay, well, let me... Re if, um, no, no, I, I don't mean that in a threatening term. No, no, but... No, no, if, but if, I mean, like, in all seriousness, I mean, there's been a, there's been a bit of a theme that's... Um, I guess developed in some of the um, uh, submissions that have been made. Uh, when I say submissions, I mean the, the oral evidence that's been given today. And um, I note, um, in fact, I was going to provide, a, and I'll do it now, I was going to provide a warning to uh, all members um, who are providing evidence today that while they're covered under parliamentary privilege now, what they say outside of this room um, will not be covered by parliamentary privilege if you're giving evidence. Uh, giving, uh, interviews and the like, and I just warn uh, members of that because I noticed some of the commentary was perhaps uh, not what I would say um, backed by evidence, but you did mention square up then, Mr Compton. What do you mean by that? Oh, I suppose it probably took me out of concept there. It would make no difference if you had 20 cars parked or one car parked. You know what I mean? But, a square, but, a, but by square up, you mean you mean to get square at somebody. What do you? No, no, what, no. What I, did you... Probably that was probably the wrong word to say. I'm not apologising because it, it wasn't an intent. Um, you said it was it was probably a square up. That was you. you I was yeah, quite, right, my, I was, I was listening words, very intently. What do you mean? What? Who was getting square at who? What? What? What is the? What? What is it you were um, putting forward as a proposition here? Oh, well, it could be because I believe, uh, in fact. When this was put to Bayside Council, the mayor told them to, yeah, we're not interested, get out of here, etc., etc. Now, maybe because of that, they, they took more parking than they were going to take. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not a councillor. I don't know. I only heard this because I read so, it. So, it, is it your submission to this inquiry then that the state government has, uh, by taking um, or increasing the clearway distances, uh, attempted to get square with your council and your mayor? Is that, oh, is no, that not the... really. I, okay. I, it was probably the wrong word to say. What I meant was... Well, no, no, but it was... It was uh, this is yeah, I know I've said it, but you just, keep going on with it. I'm trying to explain, answer. simply, was it just to square up the situation, if you like, clear it out. If you put one parking spot or 20, the ones you take away are the ones that are ruining our CBD for our residents and for our, uh, uh, our shop. Uh, so clear, you mean just squaring up the parking alignment? That's probably better put. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's just, yeah, better put. Thank you. It was just if you've got one car, they, and, and there's you've got a, all the traffic behind. That's fine. If you've got 20 cars, it makes no difference. If you know what I mean. 
But, but anyway, we're all thank finished you, on that point. Yeah. I might just quickly um, ask one question, then go to Mr. Mallow. Just on the issue of noise, I'm not sure who wants to answer this. Um, we have had some views put locally that the noise is really significant. When we had our tour earlier, that was certainly the case, I think, for committee members. To what extent is that impacting on sleep um, for people? Who wants to jump in on that? Well, I live in Kinsale Grove, which question. is just off Stony Creek Road. Sorry to steal the thunder, but I mean, everyone else is welcome. And you hear the trucks all through the night yeah. because they've got their air brakes coming past on virtually adjacent to the RSL in the next street. And the traffic flows because why would they use a toll? Why would they pay a toll? So they just zoom through air brakes coming into the, the lights at Bexley. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll sit there and then we'll go to Mr Mellon. Thanks. I live on 315 Forest Road, Bexley. So my property has a retail shop, some 98 square metres and a shop top um, small apartment. Um, I also have um, a single woman that lives uh, upstairs as a tenant. So what can I tell you about the noise? Um, the retail tenant um, will be exiting and giving up the lease, I guess. Um, they, that tenant has been paying rent. Um, that said, it has been very, very cheap rent because the impact of this situation with the noise, pollution, vibration that shakes the building at all hours, not just business hours, in fact some days it is heavier at night. Um, so this tenant is vacating um, and I'm concerned that I won't be able to get another tenant or I will be able to get a tenant but at very, very, let's say, dirt cheap rent mm. Mm. that doesn't match the inflation. Mm then the situation on a personal level is, um, I haven't brought them today, but I am actually using melatonin, which is, for people that don't know, it is a medicine that helps regulate sleep. Um, and I haven't made mention that in my submission because I think this issue is broader than just myself. But I wonder, I wonder how many other people are dealing with this. I've also invested in some shutters window shutters that are not doing the job. And I've applied for the noise abatement plan through Transport New South Wales. Mm. And since you asked that question, Chair, I am yet to get an answer. I believe I submitted that application well before Christmas. I recently received a letter to say, we will come out and do an assessment in June. Mm. But the same letter says it will be a further 12 weeks after that visit before we can tell you what we decide. And that visit is supposed to, uh, I guess, analyse and assess the impact of noise hmm. on my building. OK, thank you for that. I can see Mr Eagley wants to make a contribution, then we'll come to Mr Mallow. Maybe just to add in there, is there's multiple schools along those, those new, new red fronts and they're heavily impacted. So I can speak for Kingsgrove High School, where I try to um, Get, get to a solution. Um, the principal has reached out to um, George's Real Council, they have reached out to um, infrastructure, school infrastructure, New South Wales, they have reached out to transport for New South Wales. They didn't get anywhere, they don't get any help. And it is really impacting the classroom and it even impacts um, COVID measurements, right? They have to choose between noise or ventilation. They can't do both anymore. So it is really a heavy impact. Um, on, on schools, they don't get help, and uh, I have to say, George Street Council is actually not helpful in, in that whole process. Um, they are just deferring it to Transport for New South Wales, who also doesn't want to hear about those issues. Okay, thank you for that evidence, Mr. Mallard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I, I want to just unpack a bit what um, Ms. Kovacic is it? Oh, I'm <laughs> thank you. I might call you Asmina, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, you I think you touched the issue of um, okay. a solution for one area impacts another area. None of us here, I, hope, I don't think so, are traffic experts. I've been 12 years on council, seven years in parliament. Uh, I live in the Blue Mountains, Graveston Highway. I was on the city council, eastern distributor, cross city tunnel, the issues of people avoiding tolls, what, and you mentioned Lake Cove Tunnel, which is interesting too. I use that one quite a bit. The surface road, Epping Highway, was reduced in width, bike lanes, speed slowed down to discourage uh, people to use it instead of using the motorway. It's the same with the Eastern 
uh, across City Tunnel. William Street reduced. In fact, it was done by Labor. They closed off e exits to the Cross City Tunnel, to the Harbour Tunnel, and it was called funneling at the time. So what I want to unpack is, do you think, set aside the tolling issue inside the tunnels, do you think that, we, 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 that we've gone the wrong direction in terms of opening up the roads to try and push to get the traffic moving through faster and not congest, not what backing up, which it used to do, that's where your clearways come in, and your um, removal of parking? Or should we be doing the opposite and, and, and making it an unattractive uh, route to get round the toll? So narrowing the road, reducing the speed, putting in parking bays and trees like we've done on William Street uh, and try and make it uh, unattractive. The Mayor of Bogota, when he came to Sydney, gave a talk at City Town Hall and he said, you know, traffic congestion is our, is our friend in terms of reducing uh, unnecessary traffic on roads. People give up. So what would you comment about that, taking that approach to the to the problem. Thank you. Look, my overall comment is I don't think there's a simple solution, no, not, no. but I think this well, community <laughs> deserves to have something better, mm. a lot better. I think the way I'm imagining this solution is to think outside the square. I've heard a lot today about kilometres and breaking down per kilometre trip, mm. comparing methodologies. But I haven't heard a lot, and I haven't read a lot, about looking to other very progressive countries, countries that have really sophisticated motorways. How do they approach this issue of tolls? Are there other models that perhaps uh, allocate a cost per resident that has a car with subsidies to pensioners, unemployed, so that the pain is distributed evenly across the state, for example? I don't know that, I'm not an expert, but I'm challenging um, the government of the day to have a look into that through a proper comprehensive study that puts on the table some really workable solutions that don't demonise one community at the expense of another. No, I agree with that. I mean, the, the, to be able to, I mean, we heard evidence from the council today about the growth in truck traffic on some of the roads, quite dramatic. Uh, and, and just observing this morning, and I went down for a walk uh, to get a coffee and was watching the trucks again today, the container trucks and big uh, pantechnicans, they're obviously going through, and the council that was here today took me aside and said, she told me what roads they were taking. We need to, and I make the point I made the other day, that's a minority of truck traffic compared to what's in the tunnel right now if we were sitting in there watching through a camera. It's, it's a very, there's still a lot in there that are doing the right thing. We need to discourage the ones doing the wrong thing going through community streets back into the tunnel. So it's a combination of pricing, but also disincentives, narrowing roads or putting in penalties like they've got North Connects. What do you think of the North Connects model, which again is complex, but where you, you, you set a regime in place that fines drivers, truck drivers, who uh, don't use the motorway. It's a tough approach, but it's one that we're using now in North Connects. Sure, look, I think, a solution that is the fairest it can possibly be for the majority of people in New South Wales is something that we should strive for. And if that solution is something entirely different or, or quite, you know, departure from the current approach or methodology, so be it. Mm. I think we are quite used to having some trucks, especially the dangerous um, goods trucks coming through. Mm. We know that, you know, we're not expecting a perfect world scenario. It's the added small, medium, large trucks, semi-trailers, um, cars, bikes, the lot. It is just an ongoing onslaught. And if it means a comparable study to what's happening in the Northwest situation that you mentioned, um, I, I don't have a view on that. I think it just needs to be better, a lot better for the community. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to say something. Yeah, sure. And Mr. Khan, did you say you were a cyclist or a cycling advocate? I'm a cyclist as yeah. well, yeah. No, I'm a cyclist as well and a big advocate for cycling the lanes. I haven't seen any infrastructure. I live infrastructure. on Stony Creek Road and I live on Stony Creek Road. No so cycle I wake lanes up there. at 3 a.m. to the trucks. Yeah. Um, if I could point out one single issue here that disrupts my family, disrupts the community I live in, it's the, it's the manner that the trucks come through um, and how... They, it's, it's obvious that they don't belong. The roads are not made to accommodate these trucks. Mm. Now, it's not equitable to have 
uh, what you mentioned before, fines, etc., to keep them out, that's great. But you need to give them some incentive to use the, the tolls, the toll roads, to use those motorways, the tunnels, etc., that are created for them. It's not, it's not fair to just say, hey, you know, get off our roads if you're found here, we'll find you. Putting up cameras, etc., to regulate all that, that's fantastic. But the issue really is, the issue really is, what do you do with all of that? What do you do with them when you push them to one side? And push them in there back. needs to be a two-pronged approach. There needs to be an approach to catch them, on the, uh, to, to do right by the truck drivers to, and to do right by the community that, that suffers within Vexley. Mm. So. Mm, okay. Can I also chip in something? I mean, you say it, it's difficult to find a solution. That's certainly true. But it's a, it's a man-made problem, right? We go back in time when the, when, the, when the tunnel was for free. It wasn't such a problem. The tunnel was, was, was proposed as a solution, and now it becomes an even, even worse situation. So obviously you have to go back there and see what, what you can do. So I guess it's, it's wrong to just assume it's, it's, it, that, that the price is given and the contracts are signed. I guess you have to bring Transurban to the table and say, look, we have a problem. Tolls are very cost sensitive, so you have to go down with, with the tolls in order to incentivize people to use the tunnel. If you did divert all, all the traffic through, through Bexley, it's not a solution, it's not sustainable, it can't work. There is even an inflation set in, um, of inflation increasing that had, had been promised. It's just getting worse. So you have to bring them at arm length to the table and, and tell them there is a problem. It's also their reputation problem because it is, it is a, um, assigned to, to, to Transurban. They got their, their contract, which are very unfair, which are really cost of living um, issues. And then, and then look at how you can bring the volume back to the tunnel by lowering the, the, the price and, 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 and increasing the volume. But the volume the is in the tunnel. I mean, increasing get the, the volume on that. Re reducing the price, right? You can also mandate the trucks. I would absolutely yeah. support that. I've just got a couple but of not, other not witnesses who want to jump in and make a contribution. Sure. Um, thank you, Chair. Then we'll come back. I'd like to just pivot the discussion briefly to the, the human side and the human impact. Um, it's an established area. I grew up in Hurstville myself uh, a long time ago, and we've always known that some of those arterial roads have got a lot more traffic. Mm. What we need to also acknowledge is that as Sydney's planning has moved forward, there's no significant distribution centres as you head out west and southwest in particular. Um, so we are essentially telling the transport companies, you've got to use those transport corridors, uh, and I get that. But in order to skip the impact on their drivers or on the subcontractors who are providing the transport, uh, if they're doing $25 a trip in tolls, I get why they'd want to get off the, the tollway for certain sections. The challenge is that um, they are now using arterial roads which have really become highways. And it's not your traditional delivery lorry. We're not talking of significant trucks, shipping containers. And if I can use the example again of the little patch where our school's located, we've got a number of independent and public schools. You, you actually, your, your hair stands watching the kids before school and after school because those yeah. children are not accustomed to growing up in a neighbourhood with such a large increase in the volume of traffic and particularly in the type of traffic. Uh, elderly people as well crossing roads, crossing Stony Creek Road, crossing Kingsgrove Road, you do have to be really worried. So I ask that we pivot things back to the human impact mm -hmm. because it's often the very vulnerable in our communities the younger children, the elderly, who are now bearing the brunt of uh, you know, a very dangerous circumstance. And I think Daniel uh, mentioned earlier, even if we look in just the last few months, there have been some, some horrid injuries to pedestrians. Hmm. And it's just logic that the higher volume of traffic which goes through, combined with a large number of pedestrian traffic, in particular a large number of schools, yep. I think we just have a responsibility to have a safer environment for very, very valid young point. people. Very valid. Has, I think just briefly, has any Mr. modelling Crompton, been done? Mr. No, I'll finish now. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Has, has any modelling been floor. done with um, prior to COVID, uh, with the amount of traffic that used to use the free M5 tunnel, M5 East, uh, AM and PM, and the numbers that are currently using it now? Because I, I'm sure there would be significant figures there. In that, um, shall we say? around COVID and the rest of it, when it all kicked in in the 2020, 
okay, things were quiet, et cetera, et cetera, and it wasn't such a big impact. But if, and you'd probably say some were using it, some weren't. But if we go back a little earlier, prior to that, prior to the toll, was there modelling done on how many vehicles used it then, how many using it now, because it could be just a, a fiscal uh, examination. You think, well, geez, if we drop that down, we'd still get our money and we'd take it off suburban roads without, you know, fear nor favour. It just, it could be a better solution. Well, well, we could put uh, that to transurban. I would think that we're not traffic experts, as I said before. I know one in this room is, I don't think. But um, the co I, we, we were essential workers during COVID. Uh, and so I drove the M5. It was a ghost town. You could shoot a gun off in there. <laughs> so I don't know if it can be compared. Oh, well, when COVID was on, the airport was closed as well. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't have the traffic. Oh, it was mm. uh, wonderful so traffic conditions. Of, that's why I say <laughs> pre-COVID, pre-toll, yeah. if you look at that, there may be something in it where West Connex or whatever, you know, that company may not be out of pocket. In fact, they may make more money. I, I don't know. Mm. I would yeah. add, for <laughs> quite the last 10 years, we've requested uh, unsuccessfully through state members' office to try to get a speed and red light camera on the corner of Stony Creek Road and Forest Road. Which, and the reason I say that is that we have trucks, but even, they might have been cleaned up by a public bus crossing where the hotel is across the other side of the road. Mm. Public buses and private motorists think, oh, it's just about to go red, I'll shoot through. Mm. And they fly down as though it's almost, uh, when it's clear to go around Stony Creek Road in the evening, they fly down there. Yeah, Unfortunately, we haven't had a death there for some years, mm. uh, but some years back, not, not to do with the toll or anything, but just a truck going down there. He was texting. A lady got out of her vehicle who lived next door to St Gabriel's Church. Mm. And she was smeared along the road and, of course, passed away. Yeah. But um, that's just another issue that could come up because it's a, mm. it's a safety issue. And because of more vehicles using it, and they run the red light. Uh, mm. There's, mm. there's no one there. That, you can't have police on every corner. But that was just something else to add. But thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for that contribution. I'll just make the observation that um, one of the things we discussed earlier and we've received evidence about previously is that call for the road network performance review to be actually released, which is one of the things that I think would go towards answering some of those uh, questions that you've referred to. Um, we're, can't, we're, I think we're moving towards the end of the question, so I wanted to give um, a couple of um, opportunities here. Firstly, Mr Khan, I think you wanted to perhaps I table have, some evidence or show a Last video. week, um, Friday, was a safe walk to school day. Um, I think it's something that uh, the Department of Education mm. requires all schools to, to roll out. Um, one of the comments made by the kids, um, very relevant comment, was when you look outside the school, um, why do you, you why, why impose this on us to have a safe walk to school day when you're doing, you're doing nothing to, on the other end, to deal with the traffic? Um, it's like a hazard that's been created and then the kids are expected to pick up and address it um, by taking extra safety measures. Anyway, the video speaks for itself. There's a video here I'd like to present to mm. uh, the panel. Um, I th if you think that's if possible may. to do now, that's okay. Otherwise, you can email it in and the secretary yeah, will circulate it. There, there, you two, yeah, there are your two okay. options. If you, okay. if you think you can... Uh, I think we're circulating. Yeah, we might nice. bring it up and I'm nice trapped. Trapped. Yeah. Can I ask how long it is? How long is the video? Two minutes and 43 seconds. Yeah. It's really hard to see it, but... Yeah, but we'll circulate. I think it's best to circulate, because yeah. I think we're all... Like, can't hear a thing. And also, Hansard can't actually... I think I, I think it's best if we actually pause it and... Um, can show you the, have this yep. Frame. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask, that's obviously led by an adult. Who, who, who a, a teacher led it, did they? Um, and what was, the, what was the catalyst for seeking to... Um, it was safe walk to school day. Okay. So how did you end up with them? I'm sorry, I'm on the PNC, I'm the vice president of the PNC. I keep going with us. Okay. okay. So uh, you can understand my you can understand my uh, my hesitancy when I see that you've come prepared with a video, you've got sheets that are said to be 
from students that have been teacher-led that are somewhat um, pre-prepared. I, I just, I, you know, look, I understand that there are issues. I might, but before I think we go down, I'll give, I'll give the opportunity for questions. We might just first agree how we're going to deal with this. So, Mr Carter, I think the suggestion is, I mean, the school's welcome to present whatever it wants to present. If you email the video in, the secretary will circulate it to members. I think that's more suitable, just otherwise it's a little bit hard to hear here. Okay, You're so welcome to table. I've circulated the uh, letter from the principal. Head yep, of the and then we'll come to questions. Yeah. And a uh, statement yeah. that has been mm -hmm. put together by a teacher. Yep. From the Great. Video. Yep. So that so you've you've tabled these and um, we'll circulate those to members. And then with this information here, do you are you seeking to table those? This is actually in the video as well. So yeah, okay, okay. All right. So we might deal is. with that. Of video. course it is. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Right. We should incorporate that yeah. some point. Yeah. Okay, Thank so you. I think Thank I think you. we're open to incorporating yeah. it via the video. Sure. That'll sure. be the yeah. easiest way to deal with it. Okay, so thank you for that. So those will be received as evidence and circulated and so the members can see The bottom line is the kids are, are concerned about walking to school and yeah. they're scared. And yeah. that's fair, fair evidence. Yeah. Right, and then we'll turn to... I, I think that's... Yeah, you can I'd just say one more point regarding the school. Yeah, and then we'll come to questions. Yeah. 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 Um, the school is based... I mean, I believe there's... Uh, the, the rest of the school from Arncliffe all the way up to Bexley, there's uh, appropriate school zoning... The school zone stops just before Bexley Public. That's where the intersection of Harrow Road and um, Bexley Road and Forest Road sees a lot of trucks going through there, a lot of traffic. But that's where, you know, there's still a risk. There's a, that's where a lot of myself included, um, parents walk up to school using that pathway. Um, we're not covered by that. We're not, we feel protected because we don't have that school zone. School zones also provide, uh, not, you know, I think it's a government requirement or I don't know the exact requirement, but lollipop ladies or lollipop men, or traffic wards, traffic, whatever you call them, the official word, but lollipop people, um, can't be placed at that intersection because it's not in a school zone. So um, one of the suggestions I'd like to put forward proposals is if you can extend the school zoning to, uh, to protect pub Bexley Public School and the kids and parents who go to that school. Um, Great. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that evidence. And now I'll right. turn to Mr. Fang for any questions. So I've got two things I want to address first. Um, Mr. Compton, um, can I ask you, um, usually people declare um, affiliations or like before they give evidence. Is there any affiliations you might want to declare now? Either a member of the Labor Party. Yeah, okay. sure. You no don't problem. have to apologize. So you're a, you are a member of the Labor Party, you ran as a Labor councillor, is that correct? Sorry, I was a Labor councillor, but that was only for a very short time, quite a long time ago. Okay. I was expelled from the party for some seven years because I didn't agree There's with the There's more expelled things. members than current <laughs> okay. members. Sorry, can I? There's more expelled members it's than not, current I'm members. Sure that's not <laughs> 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 Mr. Fang. Happen. Can I ask the other members, uh, does anybody have any political affiliations that they wish to declare other yep. than Mr Compton? Yes. So I'll declare that uh, I am a member of the Labor Party, okay. um, but I'm, just, I'm here representing our school. Understood. <laughs> anybody else has any declarations they want to make? Okay, thank has you. Has anyone else been expelled? Yeah. <laughs> nearly, nearly. <laughs> nearly seven years. <laughs> <laughs> the right so one anyway. last thing I want to just discuss. Um, I've got this, uh, Mr Khan, I've got this letter um, from the students in, in, in stage, it says stage three students. Um, I'm not too sure if it should be year three or stage three, but... Um, year five, six. Sorry? Year five, year five six. six. Thank yeah, you. Stage three. Um, one, uh, I'm going to note that the language that's sort of used in here was... Is, is less like something that children would say and something that would be more, I would say, adult directed. Now, I'm going to make the observations. The first thing is you've come pre-prepared with a video. The second thing is you've come pre-prepared with handwritten sheets. You've got a letter here that's unsigned that is said to be from stage three students but is 
probably more written um, in um, an adult's, I'll say, tone, given the formatting errors and everything that is included. Um, I have concerns that, that perhaps this whole um, uh, presentation is somewhat being led and that it's not the students at all. Would that be a fair assumption? Being led by? Well, somebody seems to be putting a lot of... Um, as you, if you've been through the Australian schooling system, which as you have, you've probably noticed that um, students don't go to school and learn to teach themselves. They've got teachers. Right. <laughs> everything that a teacher has written that statement. Um, and that has been a so it, so statement from the children. So... The video that you'll see, there, those are the kids' words, and I think that's, that will be a lot more true to form. I personally Who am not... Who filmed it? Um, I am not a teacher at the school. I have my kids going to that school. Who filmed so the video? So I can't give you too much... Who filmed the video? Um, Nancy DeBello, one of the teachers at the school. And is that the same person that wrote this letter? Probably, yes. Yeah. I don't think it's... Uh, I mean, fair, fair. Mr. Khan has brought along evidence from the school. We should accept that evidence. I don't know why we're doing this uh, uh, I'm, accusation. I'm, not, I'm just trying to drill down as to but whose voice the sentiment is. sentiment is the kids are concerned, and I can understand it, about going to school and the traffic. I yes, understand. definitely. That's a sentiment. Yeah, yeah well, just, just to, uh, to emphasise, the school's entitled to put any evidence they yes. want. I mean, any committee member can ask questions about it, but you're more than entitled to provide any of this evidence. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Feng, did you I'm any... Glad I'm concluding now. Right. Okay. Sorry, I have also have my own statement that... Um, sorry, I didn't print out seven yeah. copies. Um, I'd like to... Well, I mean, that's so that's a there. statement then from you. Yeah, I didn't read all, the yeah. whole thing yet. Yeah. Good. I kept it brief, so... We're grateful for that, that, but uh, also grateful for the written thank statement, you. so you're tabling that. And I'm finally going to um, just come back to Mr. McFarlane as well with the... Um, submission you've given us on this issue you're raising about the discrepancy, one of the things that the committee could choose to do um, is to send that to Transurb and ask them to respond to the facts you've put in, the, um, mm. in your submission. Is that something that might be helpful as a path forward to um, uh, deal with the issues you're putting in front of the committee today? I uh, mentioned Transurb and WestConnects a number of times in that note and I think they're probably the right people to address that because they own and operate the websites that most of that information comes from. Yeah. Not, okay. not counting the kilometre yeah. number right. of So persons. that's something we might, might potentially put to transfer okay. and or to transport. But the committee will discuss that afterwards. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. All right, if there's any other uh, questions, I think we'll um, leave it there. I really want to thank you for that evidence you've um, given us today. It's been really helpful. We are here looking at the M5 corridor because of the concerns that have been raised about the impact in this specific uh, corridor. So that's why we're here, but your evidence has been really important to helping us understand that, and the committee's really appreciated the chance this morning to have a walk around and look at uh, what's going on in your community. So thank you for that. Uh, for those, I think there was at least one question taken on notice, in which case the answers will need to be returned within... 21 days, but the secretary will be in contact with you uh, in order to facilitate that. With that, I'd like to thank you again, and we're bringing this uh, hearing and uh, potentially this inquiry to a oh, uh, really? potentially <laughs> <laughs> to a close. Thanks for thanks for your time. Thank, thank you for you. your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.